I wanted to talk about Hell Week. Was there ever a time during that week that you were like, man, my fucking body is like, I don't know if it's going to go tomorrow. I do remember Thursday night, you do a final paddle basically around the entire island of Coronado. So I never really got the good hallucinations, but I remember I'm, I'm steering my boat and one of my officer buddies starts paddling so hard. It's like jerking the boat to the right. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, we got to go. We got to go right now. And I was like, all right, what's happening? He's like, that clown's gaining on us. And I was like, what? He's like, that clown on the bicycle is gaining on us. And we're, you know, we're in the ocean. <laughs> I didn't see a clown, but I remember turning around to see if there was a clown you know because i was so tired there wasn't and i remember as we came into the bay all the pilings i think at a distance just because my eyes were so tired i thought there was a fence like across the bay and i remember committing real energy to like how are we going to get this boat over this fence I mean, what a pain in the ass the instructors probably put that fence over there i don't remember a fence being here maybe we can push the boat over the fence or like deflate it a little bit and get it under the fence i mean you just <laughs> you're hurting by the end my name is Derek wolf I'm a Super Bowl champion and a 10-year NFL vet. Now, after a decade of professional football, I'm focusing on my other passions. Hey everybody, welcome to the Wolf Untamed podcast. Today's guest, special guest, Rourke Denver. Rourke played four years at Syracuse. He was an All-American lacrosse player, two-time national champion before he joined the Navy SEALs, where he was a command leader and went on over 200 missions and was a complete badass. So now he's written two books and he's a public speaker. So excited to have him. Hope you enjoy it. Fork Denver. Welcome Boom. to the Wolf Untamed podcast, Thank brother. Yeah. Thanks for making it. it down. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It wasn't too far of a drive, right? No, it was easy. You probably thought it was going to take a little longer to get here and then. It, it, it can. I mean, I, I, uh, I you know, make my home out here. Don't tell people exactly where so I can keep, uh, you know, that little bit of standoff distance, but uh, easy to come get to you. Let's uh, let's start at the beginning. Sure. All right. Let's go back to your childhood where you yeah, grew yeah. up. Yeah. And then uh, let's work through. Where'd you, so where'd you grow up? Yeah, of course. I was born in San Francisco, and then my dad um, and mom moved me down to kind of the South Bay area. So right in the heart of Silicon Valley right in the heart of a spot that, you know, certainly, I guess, politically and some of the decisions being made out there wouldn't be my, my top spot to live anymore. And then, then just the cost, because when we grew up there, it was like apricot orchards, a normal place to grow up. You know, my brother and I felt like this was middle class, regular America. And, and, and frankly, that's what it was. You didn't know people down the street were building computers in the next high tech, uh, you know, thing that'll change the world. Um, so for me, it was a great place to grow up. My dad's a, 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 an attorney, a, a trial room lawyer, very, very bright, disciplined, focused, driven, um, amazing, amazing mentor and, and leader. My mom's very much the opposite, very artistic and kind of uh, free spirit, which was great for us because it kind of gave us sort of both things you need. We kind of believe, my brother and I believe you could do anything and then here's how you do that, which is setting to the task of, of working and getting there. Yeah. So, um, so that was a great, you know, you know, kind of a great start, but I played water polo in the fall. I would have played football like you, but our football team, I went to a public school. They hadn't won a game in like four years <laughs> there. The, the water polo team was like one of the best in the state. I was like, Hey man, I'm getting in the pool. So I, I did that in the fall. And then I started playing lacrosse in the spring and that ended up being my college path. So my, my a lot of family in, in New York, both in Brooklyn and then upstate New York, and I ended up getting recruited to play lacrosse at Syracuse, which in the time was you know, one of the true blue blood powerhouse, you know, programs. So I oh, got yeah. to play there for four years. We won two national championships when I was there and in it the whole time. Um, so just a ball. And then I guess to kind of get through the, 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 the wave tops of the, of the bio in the fall of my senior year, I had no idea what I wanted to do next. You know, all my buddies were going to go down to New York city to make their fortune or, you know, carry on and figure out what they're doing. And I, I just felt restless and like, I wanted to keep playing rough and do something with some adventure to it. And I'm a big reader, and my dad, my dad brother, uh, brother are as well. My dad sent me a paperback copy of Winston Churchill's My Early Life, which is a book that that great British statesman wrote, you know, in his late life, but kind of captured his young life. And something about that was just a call, you know, kind of a call to service and action. And so I knew I wanted to serve. I did a little bit of research, a bunch of reading on Rangers and Green Berets and, you know, every unit I could kind of put my hands on, Marines, everything. And I, I, there was very little about the SEALs in that era. You couldn't hardly find anything about it. But the only passage I found about it said about 80% of the people that try don't make it. And I was like, that's... That's my spot. Let's and do and it. what year is that? That was uh, so that would be ninety six is when I was my senior year and a captain and and finishing off my time at Syracuse and then I put that application in. It took me almost a year to find out I didn't get in, um, 
the comp- competition to get an officer slot in the, in the SEAL teams is I, I've I've never seen it's equal. I mean, y- you've experienced it the, to get to the most elite level. That pyramid and that that mountain gets very 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 steep. Yeah, and uh, and the numbers just drop off in ways that you can't believe. But um, I'm not good with no. So when I got turned down, I was like, ah, that won't do. So I I kind of rebuilt a new package, a new application, and that one got picked up. So um, the adventure That's- began then. That's cool. I, re- I was excited to talk to you about this because this is, um, you know, my path in life was, you know, I had a rough childhood and then <clears throat> the things were, you know, really rocky, but football was like my, my love. I loved football, but if that didn't work, I was like obsessed with special forces and Navy SEALs. Yeah. I was, like yeah. obsessed with it. Yeah. You know, it was something I was like super interested in. Sure. And it was really like my backup plan. It was like, if I, this doesn't work, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I had not like, cause you know, teachers would be like, well, what's your plan? I'm like, well, I'm going to go to the NFL. And they're yeah. like, well, maybe that doesn't happen for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Maybe not. Yeah. You know, they're yeah. like, well, look at all the great players from our high school that didn't make it. And sure, I'm like, sure. uh, well, that's not, they're not me, yeah, you know? And I didn't right. really care, but uh, you know, and I would say like the military and they'd be like, well, well, aren't you in the ROTC and all this other, I'm like, I don't have to, you don't have to do that yep. to take that route. No, you know? there's so, a lot of routes. Yeah. So I was, I was excited to talk to you and hear like how, what that path looked like for you, yeah. you know, post, cause you're athlete, obviously sports is like yep. all consuming. And then when it's gone, it's like, yeah, okay. I need something else to fill that for sure. You know? So, so what was that like? Uh, you got accepted. It took what, two years to get accepted? About two years to get into the program. So yeah. what'd you do for those two years? Just train? Yeah, so I, I, I came back to Colorado. My mom was up in Steamboat, as I mentioned. And so I was working on uh, a ranch up there in the summer, you know, up with horses and, um, you know, taking people out on rides and kind of managing, um, you know, just the things that happened to that ranch. Great job. Awesome summer job. And then I enjoyed it. And then uh, I was on the ranch when I found out, like I said, it took it, it took a long time in the process to actually find out I didn't get selected. I remember my dad called me. He's a very, you know, kind of straightforward. He's not going to sugarcoat anything. He's like, hey, I just got the letter from the Navy. They didn't pick you up. Tell me what you want to do and how I can help. And we'll go from there. I'm like, fair enough. So I took a run. And like all of us, I had to, you know, beat myself up a little bit with a workout to kind of settle myself down. And then <laughs> it took about 10 minutes after that to be like, all right, let's figure out a way to win on this thing. And so then I, I, I called in some, not favors, but there's some people I knew within the community that that could maybe give some better guidance. And I learned later that timing has a lot to do with it. That, that first application I put in, mine kind of made it into the last moment you could get it in. So I was at the bottom of the stack and they don't get to the bottom of the stack. Yeah. But then when I reapplied, they love seeing that. Cause like, look, they're looking for people that don't quit. That want to be there. Yeah. And so you're like, look, you, we tell, you, no, you say, you know, BS, then <laughs> you're probably one of our guys. So, yeah. um, so I got picked up the second time, but then that two years, as you kind of calculated, it was, it was, it was funny. I got selected based on guys that were leaving the Academy and ROTC they deferred me for almost 10 months until when I could start officer school. So I'm up in the mountains of Colorado staring a winner in the face. I'm like, man, I'm not going to be the best place to swim and train and, you know, do that unless it's Rocky style, you know, in, in Russia. And so I, uh, I sold my Jeep, flew over to Hawaii and lived in Hawaii for about 10 months. <laughs> and so I, I you know, got off the plane, almost hitchhiked to Lahaina, which, you know, sadly now has you know, been burnt to the ground. Yeah. But it was phenomenal. I made great friends. I was in the water all the time, surfing and training and spearfishing and goofing off and, and running. So it was just a perfect window of time to, you know, be single, goofing off focused on what I want to do next and uh, not a lot of stress and then and then start OCS and the SEAL program after that. So how did um how did that go? Like what did what did, how did, when you when you finally started like what yeah. was like were you nervous? Yeah. Like, Cause there's a lot of, that's a lot of buildup. It is. I mean? Yeah. No, you're right. I, I don't think I really thought in terms of the buildup that then the expectation was different than I expected. I think it was like, hey you put in the time and 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 you, you know, wanted this. Let's go. Um, I hear a lot of SEALs talk about this and a lot of special operators across the different services of everybody's, you know, experience through the basic course. I think there's a preponderance of people that will say, you know, at, it's so hard at some point, everybody thinks about quitting. Um, I didn't find that to be the case. It never occurred to me to quit. And I actually think the bulk of SEALs that make it, that's the case. You know, my cl- class started with like 186 candidates and we graduated 22. And out of that 22 on, on graduation day, I think, I think 21 of us knew we were going to be there. Yeah. And I think one of them was probably like, holy shit, I made it. Like, I got to call <laughs> mom, you know, like, like couldn't believe that that happened, you know, and, and he probably ended up being a great seal too. But I think, I think most of the people that show up there that are going to do it, that they're Cortez, man, they burn the boats at the beach. Yeah. Like, There's no going back. And so I'm either going to make it or I'm going to die. And that, that was kind of my, my philosophy, but 
the 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 flip side of that coin is, as I say that it sounds more intense than I think it was, and not that it wasn't intense. I felt like I was home, and this will make sense to you playing at elite level. Like when I played college sports, I played a Division One program. We were at the Final Four all four years I was there. I ended up a two-time champion. I was an All-American my senior year. I mean, I'd played as that, that's that's as best as you can do in that sport. It's grown a lot since then with pro leagues and things, but that was that was the pinnacle, and it used to in some ways bother me that I ran harder, worked out harder, felt more focused and more, I don't know, intensity towards that pursuit than, than a lot of my teammates. Now, mm. now, now, bear in mind, we're playing at a national championship level, so there's nobody there that was like mailing it in. No, I, but know, I, I know exactly I, what you I, mean. I ground as hard as you could. And, and, and look, most of the guys that played there had played their entire life at Blue Blood programs and some of the best regions of the world. I grew up in California. There wasn't a lot of lacrosse there. Yeah. So I really had to... I was like, talent and my experience isn't going to get me there. It's going to be effort. So I, I put that in. And, and, and I feel like there was a component to where I, I was surprised that I was the only one running hard on every single sprint. And when I got to SEAL training, about the time we get through Hell Week, I remember kind of looking to my right and left and like, oh, I'm home. Like everybody here is willing to pick me up and go on a dead run as long as it takes and to do whatever it takes. And so I, I really felt I found my peer group. So that there was no part of me being there that was like, Oh, let me feel this out. I was like, I am home. You did know, you, that proved to be true. Do you, did you, were you always that way? Like, were yeah, you, even as like a way. young kid, like, always were you always way. like the yeah. hardest worker in the room? You know, yeah, like, my seat, my, I think my dad kind of helped forge that, and my brother and I, but I also don't think parents can really make their kids something they're not. I think you help them become the best version of themselves. Yeah. So, I mean, he couldn't make us do that. I just like suffering. I like going harder. I like sprints. I like preseason. I remember my senior year of high school, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a team captain of the water polo team. My brother's a freshman when I'm a senior. And I remember we're doing like, you know, kind of in the pool, suicide swings out, out and back to where people are just going to failure. And I remember on like the last, what had to be about the last 10 sprints, I'm, I'm swimming to the wall, you know, hit the wall and I'd look up and I was for three years, I was alone at the wall, alone, particularly at the end, because that's where it's just all guts. And the seniors were on one side of the pool, then it goes, you know, kind of stratifies down to where the freshman is. And I start hitting the wall, and I'm looking down, and I can see somebody's hitting the wall, like, close to me. And I'm like, what, the, who is this? You know, and I'm like, in a bad mood about it. Yeah. And after four or five times, I was like, oh, it's my brother. Yeah. <laughs> He's the only one that's willing to go this hard. Yep. And so it was just, it was always that way. Yeah. It was always that way. Yeah. And, and I, I think the people, they do that, they do that for themselves. I mean, they know they're giving mm -hmm. that to the team, but I... I couldn't go to sleep at night if I if I didn't lay it out there. I was always the same way. Yeah. When, when you you know any workout that we did, you know, all the way through high school and college and the NFL, if I didn't give, like, because because it, it would happen. You know, you'd have those days where you'd be like, oh, you have off days. Uh, you'd be like, oh, yep. fuck, I did, I just I feel like I had a little bit more to give. Yeah. And you you can feel like that next day you it hurts you feel it. like shit about yeah, it. it hurts you know. It. Yeah. So I, I'm a strong believer in if you quit once, it's really easy to quit that next time. So. But on the on the flip side, every time that you don't quit, like that dopamine, that dopamine hit that you it. get from doing that, yeah, for sure. Like, and you can continue that. Like, yeah. it's the best drug there is. No doubt. You know, no doubt. Uh, yeah. And I, I continue that to this day. You know, I go into my gym right here in the, and and just suffer yeah. in there. You know, yeah. and it's yep. like, you know, what do you do? I always coaches always used to say, "What are you doing when no one's looking?" Yep. You know, because anybody can like show up on game day and like yeah. give their all. But what do you do? What are you doing in practice when there's no fans there? Yeah. What are you doing during that workout when nobody's watching, when nobody's looking, when your teammates, oh, nobody, but, and then as you become older, you realize like, oh, people are watching me. They like, are, yeah, for sure. When you're a, considered a leader, yep. and um, I never asked for leadership. Yeah. Like, I never was like, oh, I want to be a leader. I was always like, I'm just going to bust my ass. There you go. And outwork everybody, and if, if people want to follow, they'll follow. But I'm yep. not going to be like that raw, raw, you know, speech yep. guy. I'm not giving yep. speeches and I'm not doing all that bullshit. Like, yeah, I get it. Uh, but if I catch you slacking off, you know, I'm going to get into your, I'm gonna dig into your ass a little bit. Like that's yeah. just the way it's going to be. And, no, it and that's it. Was it like that in the military though? Was it like did you find yourself in position as a leader? Because obviously, as an athlete, people are going to follow you. If you're not yep. American and you're a team captain, yep. people are going to yep. follow your lead. So yep. you have a responsibility to do that. Was it the same way once you got to the military? Was it like? Hey, uh, everybody's kind of looking at me at this point, and I'm gonna have to be that guy that uh, yeah. drags every when it, when it, when the whole unit is dragging ass. I'm gonna have to be the one that keeps this, you know, keeps our ass going. Or yeah, is it, or I mean, was I, it more of like a, hey, I'm gonna have a bad day sometimes, so I'm gonna yeah. need you to fucking pick me up on these. It's a days good question. I'd, I'd say it's a little bit of both. I mean, I think 
everybody has those bad days, you know, day, days when you're down, days when you're hurt. And I remember days in Hell Week, which is kind of our famous week of training where we had guys crash and our boat crew, you know, the, your family during that week, we were really good about taking care of one another. It wasn't beating that guy up. It's like, all right, we'll carry him for a little bit of time. I bet he's going to rally and he's going to carry me. And there, there's very much that that support and team element there. Um, you, you know, you've met other SEALs and, and, and talked to other SEALs. I mean, we, we don't refer to each other as SEALs. We refer to each other as team guys. So the, it, it is baked into the name and the DNA of what we do that it is a team sport. Yeah, you know, we don't team. we don't do courage, we don't do combat, we don't do any of that thing alone. There's only been a few guys that have been on the battlefield alone, and that was a mistake. Like something happened wrong yeah. for that to be the case. And guess what? The cavalry's coming, so we don't we don't do that. But um, I I don't remember as an officer ever you know, saying I've got to pick everybody up and I've got to carry the team in any way. Our guys are so intense and driven and fired up. Um, <laughs> the, the job of the SEAL officer is like to pull the reins back as opposed to crack a whip. You know, I think, uh, I think, you know, some political leadership think like we pull our troops back for their safety. We do that for the enemy. Yeah. Uh, if I let my guys go old Testament, worst parts of the Bible, dude, we, I mean, we would have been done with Afghanistan about, a year and a half, you know, <laughs> so it's, um, it, it's, it's a unique organization. I mean, I, I love the military. I, I, I sincerely love every one in the military. I don't care if you were, you know, cooking, turning wrenches on a, uh, a Humvee or, or in an elite unit, if you want to even call it that name, I don't even know if that's the right way to, to describe them, but, um, I think so. Seals are very unique, are unique compared to even the rest. I don't, I don't say that better or worse. There's just a personality and a vibe in the way we treat one another that, that will make other units skin crawl. I mean, you see a Marine major that's running a combat unit. Everybody's going to be in the, for the most part, in the same uniform, the same gear, everything's kind of, you know, standardized and ready. I mean, he'd see my guys come out of the like ready room and two guys are wearing flip flops. Somebody's got a hat on backwards, a patch from, you know, the Jolly Roger pirate flag or, twin towers that were falling down and different guns and all kinds of crazy systems. One guy's got Solomon shoes. Other guys got combat boots and it'd make them lose their mind. They're like no discipline whatsoever. And you're like, nah, it's different. Like our guys mm -hmm. manage themselves. If he couldn't do his job effectively better than frankly, anyone on the battlefield, we'd say choose some different boots, but he's proved it. And if you want to try and keep up with them, knock yourself out. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a it's a very different organization that way. So my guys would call me more of a nickname than they'd call me, you know, Sir or LT or something like that. I, it, once you get to executive command, then there's a little bit more formality that um, almost bothers you as an officer because you still want to be you one know, of the guys, with the boys. You know? But um, I also had a great sense, I think, early on to to kind of touch back on the you know that working hard and always doing that right thing. The thing I liked about that or that I recognized in that that I don't think I realized early is I. I, I'm a teetotaler. I don't drink. I, I never drank. We had some really mean drunks in my family across a lot of generations. And my brother and I both were like, you know what? This is not going to be good for us. So we, we, we avoided that. And I think it paid dividends. I don't think I realized later in my leadership career that I was like, man, I, I kind of gave myself a double gift there. I, I always did it right, whether it be workouts, training, shooting, jumping, all the things we needed to do. I got the paperwork done. I did everything I needed to do. But then I carried myself in such a way that I was like, look, if I told my team to be at a place at 6 a.m., they knew I was going to be there at 5.15. Yeah. If I told them to have their uniform ready, they knew mine was going to be ready and looking sharp. And by doing that, you just maintain a level of kind of gravitas and respect that that they don't have anything on you. You know, I used to tell my junior officer, like, look, you want to go steaming with the boys. That doesn't bother me. But if they still stay till two in the morning, you need to leave at 12. Yeah. If they're drinking 12 beers, you got to drink four. You can't be the guy that they carry back to the apartment. They'll own you for the rest of your career. Yep. So that that's that's what paid dividends for me with that discipline and that work ethic. And I think the way, you know, I hope I carried myself and I held myself that standard is I, th I think – it's pretty hard to punch holes in the way I was doing it. You might you might disagree with an idea. That's fine. Those will be argued to the day you die. But but you couldn't disagree with the standard, right? Yeah. You set that standard, yep. so those guys heard, were like, you know what? And that probably held them back because those guys, all the seals I know, they like to they'll party. They like when it comes it, time to party, they they're getting, get whatever. The, it's yep. what it doesn't matter what they do. Yep. They are going to do they go it hard. Yeah, hard as they hell. Go hard. And yeah. uh, and that's why I that's that I think that's what I was so attracted to. Yeah. Uh, because I'm the, I have that same mentality. Whatever mm -hmm. it is that I'm doing, um, to a fault, yeah. I will do it Max as hard it as I fucking can. Yeah, of course, you know, of course. Whether it's going out to party or, yeah. uh, you know, it took it took marriage. You know, my wife she yeah. just walked away, but she uh, yeah. Yeah. she would tell you that like she had to 
pull the reins in a little of bit. Of course, of course, yeah. Because I would, I would train my ass off and work my ass off and play my ass off, and then I would, um, I would do that all season, and then when the season was over, I yeah. would like unleash. Yep. My like the party animal for course, like two weeks. And yeah. It was like, ah, uh, man, you know, is it is it like should I have just partied a little bit during the season? And yeah. And you know, not been so wound up tight. And then, but no, I yeah. think the I would never, I wouldn't change anything about the way I did, I did it. Like, I like your was, methodology. Yeah. It was, I, you know, and I, now that I'm older, it's like, I, I don't really like to drink anymore. Yeah. Like it's not something that like, I think a lot of people live for the weekend. You yeah. Know? And they're like, yeah. oh, I can't wait to get done with this work week so I can drink fucking whole case of beer. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, I never really, we, in college, we were kind of like that. Yeah, I mean, you saw it. You probably saw how it was. Like, hey, we're wow. gonna work our ass off all week, and then we get done with the game. We're gonna party we'll and play have hard, fun, and, for sure. And uh, and that was one thing. But once you get to the NFL, it's a job. Yeah, and you, we were we're waking up on Monday morning after a Sunday night football game. We're yeah. doing fucking heavy squats. That's like, right. It's not. There's That's no right. time to be yeah. hungover after being in 15 car wrecks. That, after, that yeah, weekend. well, after yeah. playing 60 snaps, yeah, you know, man. in the interior defensive line. Oh my god. There's no time yeah. for. Uh, and I made that mistake one time. Yeah. My rookie year, yeah. our first fucking, my first start, you know, yeah. our first game of the season, my first start in the NFL yeah. against the Steelers. I went out there and balled out and went crazy, yep. had a great game, and I got fucking hammered after yeah. the game. Success, I made and, it. Yeah. yeah, and woke up and was like, oh, fuck. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> We're doing heavy squats. Yeah. And I threw up a couple times, and yeah. I was like, never again, you know, because it was, I had guys like Peyton Manning, yeah. right? Peyton was like, hey, man. You want to be course. good or do you want to be great? Yeah, yeah. I remember him having that conversation with me. Yep. I threw up in that workout and he came over to me. He's like, hey, man, you want to be good or you want to be great? Oh, I love that. He's like, uh, the great ones will sacrifice what you – and then I had another coach that said, uh, don't sacrifice what you want the most for what yeah. you want right now. Yeah, I love you it. Know, so, yeah. like, don't sacrifice that, like, long-term goal for the short-term fun. And that stuck with me, you know, and I and I always held on to that. And I, I, I tell my kids that now. Yeah. Like, that's something I, I still tell my kids. You know, don't sacrifice – what you want the most for what you want right now. So I think, I you know, that. I commend yeah. you for not, for not, for like being able to hold off on that. You know what I mean? Cause it, that peer pressure is there. Yeah. I'm sure that I'm sure you guys are like, come on, have a drink with us. Come I, have I, drinks. You I know, wrote, I wrote about it in my, in my first book. I wrote about it that, that, um, every, once you made the team at Syracuse, a freshman, you made the actual travel roster you're on, whether you're a recruit scholarship athlete or otherwise, you know, you still gotta, you still gotta make the team and get a Jersey. They have, uh, uh they did in my era, this, party called rookie bring a bottle night so every rookie had to bring a you know good bottle of alcohol and then you know they'd make the rookie drink half the thing and the seniors enjoyed the rest and i remember i remember one of our team captains at the time buddy and i were just talking about this other day one of our team captains was just this big bruiser wrestling champion you know great lacrosse player and just a beast of a man just an absolute archetype of what i wanted to be when i was going to be a senior yeah and we had a locker right next to each other i was the first kid to come from california to play at that school and at that kind of elite level and i remember he, he, you know he just always gave me little bits of encouragement because it was tough as a young guy coming up and i remember i walked in that i showed up that party late i think all the seniors kind of licking their chops because they knew i didn't drink i mean we'd been together for a while and it was like all right we're gonna make you know rourke's gonna drink tonight and i remember walking and i i went to a i went to a liquor store i didn't know hardly anything about alcohol i'm like hey what's the best bottle i can afford they give me some you know johnny walker blue or something like that yeah. i buy that thing i walk straight up to reggie who is our team captain i put that bottle in front of him i was like hey this is for you in the senior class you guys know i don't drink there's plenty of you that can rush me and hold me down and pour alcohol down my throat if you want to. I'm just telling you, whoever gets me first is going to pay the man. <laughs> and then we'll move on from there. So we see what happens. And I put that bottle down from him and I walk to the porch. And I remember looking through the window of that porch and you could tell the seniors were like having a big conversation. And Reggie and I talked about it later. He's like, I told him, I was like, boys, you want to grab him, grab him. I ain't grabbing him. And Reggie could have like whooped me at that point. But, you know, he's like, that kid's got something. You know, let's see what happens. So, yeah, it, uh, it was a good fit for me. I mean, I do think there's times when probably having a, you know, having a bourbon or a glass of wine with a good good steak is probably the right thing. I just like we're describing my, my you know, sort of inability to not take something to the max. I'm pretty sure I'd take that to the max, and that that wouldn't be good. I've, I've seen that play out. So, no, it was a good fit for me, but um, – no, it's uh, the, the the SEAL teams, the military, that whole thing was um, a, a real gift. I ended up in the right place. I love the discipline of it. I love the schedule of it. Um, I definitely miss a lot of things. I've had a great transition, but, I, I you know, it was a special, special thing to be a part of. Hey, guys, I want to talk to you about one of my favorite sponsors, Juniper Mountain Coffee, coffee without compliments. You're getting high quality coffee without the high prices. This is an American company that stands behind their values. They stand behind their coffee. These guys make some of the best coffee I've ever had. 
It's a coffee I drink every morning. Juniper Mountain Coffee works directly with the farmers, paying fair wages, and that way you have no middleman, no BS, no garbage. You're getting high quality products. So go check them out at junipermountaincoffee.com. Yeah, I wanted to talk about Hell Week. Sure. It was ever because everybody's body, everybody's mind will like tell them like, "Hey, my body's gonna just yeah. shut down if I don't stop right now." And if yeah, and then you just got to push through that because yeah. the 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 threshold is way further than people think. No. So I, was yeah. there ever a time during that week that you were like, man, my fucking body is like, I don't know if it's going to go tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say I hit one of those thresholds. What, I, what I'd say is I, I don't think a lot of people can kind of appreciate where hell week kind of falls in the, in the, in the continuum of the program. So you've already been at the training center for three months, maybe two months. If you came like the day before a class started, but I'd been there. Cause I got, when I checked in, you've been almost there three months of just getting crushed. Your class has probably lost a hundred candidates before you get to hell week. So you're already broken. You're predisposed to stress fractures. You probably got some type of pneumonia at that point. I mean, you're not, you're not going into hell week, like prime time game right. ready. You're broken, you know? And then that thing starts on Sunday finishes on Friday. You go on a 24 hour clock. There's three sets of instructor shifts that run that day. You, you start on Sunday. You don't sleep at all until Wednesday. You get about an hour and a half nap on Wednesday. If you knew what you were going to feel like after that nap, you skip it. Thursday, you get another nap. Friday, you graduate. So it, it's just cold, wet, miserable, working hard the entire time. I would say I enjoyed it more than I had a bunch of like fail points where I thought things were going to go wrong. I would say by by Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday night, I had something going on in a, going on in my knee. In hindsight, it wasn't anything serious. It damn sure felt serious with a big boat on your head and running next to your boys and covering ground. So I, I was worried something was going to go wrong there because they can they can pull you. For the guys that are going to make it, the thing you worry about the most is having a medical issue because you know you right. can't can't control that. So I, I remember being a little concerned about that, but not to the point that I thought I couldn't. Um, suck it up. I wouldn't say the program wasn't hard enough to ever get me to my break point, but it, you know, like I said, for most of the guys that make it, it doesn't. It's just they feel like they're in the right place. I, I do remember Thursday night, you do a final paddle basically around the entire island of Coronado. So you start out in the ocean almost by Mexico, you paddle all the way up through the mouth of the bay and then back around to the compound. And Thursday nights when people start kind of hallucinating because they're just so punchy from 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 no sleep and I, I never really got the good hallucinations but I remember I'm I'm steering my boat and one of my officer buddies starts paddling so hard it's like jerking the boat to the right and I'm like dude what are you doing he's like we gotta go we gotta go right now and I was like all right what what's happening he's like that that clown's gaining on us and I was like what he's like that clown on the bicycle is gaining on us and we're <laughs> you know we're in the ocean and I I didn't see a clown but I remember turning around to see if there was a clown you know because I was so <laughs> tired you know and there wasn't and then somebody else thought an aircraft carrier was gonna roll over on top of us. And I remember as we came into the bay, I think it was the Coronado Bridge that goes over from San Diego proper onto our island. All the pilings, I think at a distance, just because my eyes were so tired, I thought there was a fence like across the bay. And I remember committing real energy to like, how are we going to get this boat over this fence? I mean, what a pain in the ass. The instructors probably put that fence over there. I don't remember a fence being here. Maybe we can push the boat over the fence or like deflate it a little bit and get it under the fence. So, I mean, you just, <laughs> you're hurting by the end, but um, no, kind of like I described at the beginning. I, I just felt like I was home. You know, it was one of those, and it's also the week where, you know, sort of, this is your, this is your stamp, you know, unless you do something dumb after that. Like if you're terrible underwater, which haven't played water, but I knew I wasn't going to be, or you do something dumb with a gun or bombs or something like that. And you just don't feel like you're going to be a good teammate. You make it to that Friday. You're probably going to be a frogman. Yeah. You know? So I think, I think it was just excitement, you know, but my dad saved an answering machine recording. They sent me recently and it's got me calling them on Sunday. Um, you know, this is like right when cell phones come out, but be like, Hey dad, I'm about to go into hell week. Feel good. Ready to rock it. Um, Sure hope you don't hear from me until Friday. And then hung up the phone. And then he's got the next voicemail was me just being like, hey, Dad, I, I made it. All good. My body's hurting. Talk to you tomorrow. You know, I'm yeah. just like beat up and like busted. But it's kind of cool to hear those two voices of somebody that like felt pretty good on Sunday and was a different voice on yeah. Friday. But super excited to have, you know, gotten that in the rearview mirror. Yeah, yeah, I bet it was like one of those... Uh like a fuck, I'm glad that's uh, I'm glad that's over with. It's a you cool know? feeling. It's a cool feeling. You know, yeah. it's it, yeah. I bet it feels fucking. Uh, it's kind of like how training camp always was. It sure. Was, yeah. It was like every fucking year, dude. We got to go through this stupid fucking training camp, and yeah. it's like, it's just one of those you have to do it, yeah, right? It's just because because it's yeah. like yeah, it's like part of, it's part of the fucking thing, like yeah. game. You got to make it through training camp, all right? Yeah. Like yeah. nobody get nobody 
It doesn't matter who you are. Yeah, Nobody you don't get a pass. gets a pass on yeah, training right, camp. Right, it's a right. rite of passage. It's gonna suck. Yeah, yeah. And you're gonna have, you know, you're gonna have days where you're like, I don't want to fucking go today. Yeah. Like I don't yep. want to get up and go today. Yeah. But you got, you have to. Yeah. You're going. It's all day long. You know, I, you know, it's 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 part of being. I call it getting calloused. Yeah. You got to get calloused up for the fucking long haul this season. I like, it. like the I season like is it. long. Yep. And you got to get calloused. Yeah. And training. The only way to get into football shape. Is to play football. Play the game. You know, yeah. it's the, it was probably the same way. In fucking, oh, it is. You can't. I don't care how many laps you swim in a pool. Nothing's nope. gonna get you ready for an actual fucking no, you gotta get water a couple polo games game. And that's you know? right. That's right. Uh, it yeah. doesn't matter how much weight you lift, how many fucking sprints you run, yeah. how many fucking sleds you pull and yeah, push. Yeah. Uh, when it comes down to it, man, uh, it's you got to go against another dude over and over and over again oh, and compete and yeah. and feel that heat, that ninety degree fucking heat. Yeah, man. And that humidity and feel you got to feel that suck. Yeah. And uh, you know I. I, I always compared um, athletes to uh, to like to veterans because not because of the uh, like there's a huge difference when it Yo, comes no, no, to no. combat and everything, but it's the same mentality when it comes to game time. No, it like never when, bo- it never bothered me when I heard you know either football players or folks that play particularly combative sports when they they almost use the metaphor for hey we're going to war. I, well, I get it. it. Doesn't hurt well, my feelings. Well, especially yeah. because they use a, like you know John Fox, our head coach John Fox, yeah. when I first got here. Uh, his dad was a SEAL. Yeah. So he fucking had SEALs in here talking to us. There you go, yeah. You know, he had, like, Marcus Luttrell come in and talk to us. Sure. You know, he had a bunch of fighter jets coming in and talking to us and yeah. shit. Like, yeah. Uh, or fighter jet pilots. And he, those guys, like, the fucking mentality is the same. Yeah. It's the same mentality. No, no, it's the same mentality. Yeah. Um, different stakes, yeah. obviously. Yeah, but yeah, same yeah. same mentality. Yeah. Uh, when it comes, but I think it's it's great because you're not, you're not, you never went into combat thinking, oh, like, if you're worried about dying or you're worried about get, it's the same way with football. If you're worried about getting hurt, you're yeah. going to get hurt. Yeah, that's right. Right. If you're thinking about that, you're yep. manifesting it. And anytime I ever went into a game thinking, man, I'm fuck, something's not feeling right. Like, yeah. I might get hurt in this game. Well, what do you know? I fucking yeah, did. Exactly. I would definitely get something would happen. Yeah. So I always yeah. went into no matter what was going on. I went into every game thinking I'm 100 percent. Yep. I am. Even though you're not, you no, know, you know, I, you're not. But I you convince totally yourself. Agree. Yeah. And that um, what I loved about. Uh, those guys was that they always talked about you what you what you think about in your mind what you think about and what yeah. you're like convinced you can con- just lie to yourself you can you have to just lie to yourself yep. like it's it uh it's almost <laughs> it's almost crazy people you tell people that and you're like what do you mean you lie to yourself yeah, yeah. i'm like no, dude no. you like it, you lie to yourself you tell yourself that you're fucking you are the best yep. and you're not gonna like you're fine yeah. like you are fucking trust your training everything's gonna be fine go out there and play your ass off and everything yeah. will work yeah. out. And that was like the way that's the way I played. And I loved it. You know, like I never played timid or scared yeah. or anything like that. And uh, was it the same way with combat? Was it like you trusted your training? So yeah. you never went in. I mean, I'm sure there's, there was always like a little bit of anxious anxiety. I had a coach one time tell me, uh, there, are you nervous or anxious? Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm anxious. And he was like, good, good. Yeah. He said, cause nervous means you're scared. Right. There's some fear there. He's yeah. like, you're just anxious because you want to get to it. You yep. want to get there. Yeah. Did you ever feel nervous going into the combat or did you ever yeah, feel no, was I it think, always like an anxious feeling? I, I think it's more that description's a better capture of it. I mean, I didn't I I you know, I remember talking to my family before the first time I deployed to what was gonna be a very, very heavy. You when know, was your first deployment? deployment? Uh I mean, I deployed pre-9-11, so 2000, 2001. I about a, did about a deployment and a half to Central South America and some of those locations for um, pre-9-11. 9-11 happened on one of those deployments. We thought we were going straight to Afghanistan, and the nightmare was we actually had to still maintain our responsibility there. So another team got to go before us, which you know killed you. Um, little did I know how much we were going to see in the next two decades, so I, I didn't miss any of it. I actually I probably hit the lottery. I talked about it with a teammate of mine the other day. The peer group, my peer group, about one or two before me, one after me, which means a year group that kind of came in and started their career um, those guys saw more combat than anybody in, in the history of this country, you know, just literally a decade and a half of chasing bad guys. Um, so the, the, the real intense stuff, 2003, 2006, you know, kind of those windows of time, which was just, um, you know, some of those are super famous deployments. I mean, the, 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 that, that was, you know, you know, Jocko and, and Chris Kyle and, um, 
that whole team was all there together, just different units, but different parts of that in those deployments in, in 2006. And I, I remember in particular that deployment, which we knew was going to be ugly and, and that therefore we were excited about it, but we knew it was going to be heavy. Um, and that there's a very good chance that everybody's coming home. I remember having a conversation with my mom, you know, this job's tough on my mom, on the moms. I remember having a conversation with my brother who we've been thick and thie thick as thieves since day one, you know, to this day. Um, you know, my, my favorite running mate of all time. And, and, and I remember, I remember telling him really, if I fell or something went wrong, just not let mom descend into, you know, hate and Despair, sadness. I'm yeah. not, I, nobody told me to go do this. Nobody for, I I'm, I'm excited to go. Uh, but I remember the toughest conversation with my dad, cause my dad's dad was killed in the Pacific theater of world war two. So he was a B 24 liberator guy. He was killed in a, in, in an accident there in, um, in, in, in world war two. And I was like, man, I hope I don't fall just so my dad doesn't have his life bookended with like his dad and a son dying in combat. Like that'd be the worst. I was probably more worried about that than I was worried about myself, you know? So no, I think, um, I think any anxiety I felt like you're saying is more was less getting killed or getting hurt. It was just failing your teammate. You know I mean? Yeah. I, I don't care what anybody has ever written about war, written about, you know, skill, ability, talent, particularly in the combat theater. In the end, the entire reason you're there for the fight, the the you know the rightness of it, the wrongness of it, whether we should be doing it, shouldn't be doing it. No one on any battlefield has ever you know drawn a sword, frankly, for their nation. They've done it for the dude to their right and left. Yep. And so that's the person you keep faith with. And if it was a SEAL teammate, all the better because I knew what he was capable of. If it was a Boy Scout sitting there with a rifleman's badge and he was shooting with me at a bad guy, I would have been. You're a brother for me right now. Let's let's get out of here. Yeah, together. we're fighting for yeah. each other. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So no, never any fear wouldn't be the right word. It was always uh, it was always you know knowing we knew how to do the job. You know our training. It's same. I'm sure it's the same thing at the elite level football. Like there's just I'm sure there's not an offensive defense defensive set you didn't know back to front. There, there, there's not a lot. Of, I mean maybe somebody tricks you with a good move, but like they're doing something new. Yeah, like you know what the, the like we know how to do this job. We are masters of the combat arts. And so on top of that fact, all our guys are bigger, meaner, stronger, and tougher than you. So if you want to, you want to get it on and toe the line, we'll ring the bell. You know, yeah. like our guys are ready. You know, Everybody's they, they, Mike Tyson said it, man. Everybody's got a plan until they yeah. get punched in the mouth. And, and look, they found, I mean, they, this has been talked about before, but they, 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 we found transmissions from the Taliban in Afghanistan being like, Hey, you see 30 dudes all in a combat line, all dressed the same, the same type fatigues, you know, kind of walking up through a Canyon, you know, go hit them. You see a dude with half of them have beards. Two of them have like hats on backwards. You see a guy that's in shorts. Do not, <laughs> do not shoot at those do dudes. Do not engage. I'm like the entire valley is about to explode into fire. You're going to pay if you hit those yeah. guys. And it was, like you said, it was a mindset. I, ne I never went into one of those engagements thinking we were going to lose. Yeah. You know, I just well, you didn't. can't. You yeah. can't have that yeah, mentality. Yeah. Yeah. You can't go into any kind of game or any, no. anything. No. And I was lucky lose. when I was at Syracuse. I mean, I... In four years, I never thought we were going to lose a game. Yeah, I'd say the last game I played my senior year, we played Princeton in the in the final four, and it was the only time. I hate to even admit it, it was the only time going to that game I thought we were in trouble. And it was much less how great Princeton was, and they were they were great, definitely in the conversation one of the best teams ever assembled. I could just tell our team was off. You know what I mean? Like I just tell the mindset was off and the vibe was off. And something about that, you know, put me on edge. And we we did we did lose that game. But you know, almost every game I ever played, if we lost, I was like, ah, we just made a mistake. They yeah. didn't beat us, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it was our fault. Yeah. It was on yeah. us. That's yeah. how I always looked at it too. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. It, that's what uh coaches will beat that in. You know, yeah. if we just would have done this and that, yeah. No matter how bad the beatdown was, yeah, if yeah. you got beat, you know, it was like, man, if we would have just it's always comes down to like two or three plays. Yeah. You know, that if you can take those plays back and reverse that or and that that's 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 you asked about the officer job. That really is the job. And I actually think it was one of my better skill sets. It, it wasn't, you know, being the best shooter, the best runner, the best even thinker. I think this comes a little bit from my dad, you know, and as an attorney, he always talked about you have to be able to issue spot, which to him meant, you know, in a case, in a given process, if you could find those one or two things that were the most important, there might be 10 important things, but the two most important, like if those you can keep your eye on the ball or manage, you'll be fine. I think I was always good at seeing that. It'd be like, hey, chaos, things are happening, things are going wrong. I know if we just do this, it's going to advance the ball or not make it any worse. And, and, um, 
like an athlete, things really did slow down the battlefield. I never felt rushed. I never yeah. felt uncomfortable. It was just like, yeah, yeah, push out to the side, flank these guys right now. I need fire over here. Let's, you know, hold back on that side of the target. I think we're getting sucked into a place we don't want to be. And it just felt very comfortable, man. Following the stuff. playbook. Yeah, just just running the playbook. And, and and you know, like like sports, we, we just done it so many times. Nothing ever happened Muscle on the memory. battlefield that was like, I'm not sure what to do. It just never happened. Yeah. 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 That's I felt like uh, that was always... That's like I think that's important because even in like life, just yep. normal life, right? People live this like comfortable, non. Um, they they live a life of zero adversity. Yeah, right. And then whenever adversity hits, they're like, "Oh fuck!" Yep. Like they panic. You know, they don't know what to do. But if you've had some, you've put yourself through adversity. Yeah. In life, and you know, been trained through the, that adversity. Whenever shit hits the fan in your life. You're ready. You're ready. And you're like, it could be anything. It could be arguments. It no could doubt. be a, um, it could be like a, you know, a car accident. It could be anything. Right. But if you, if you've never had adversity and experienced adversity, when it happens, yeah. I mean, it's easy to fucking lose your mind. You're in, you know, it. yeah. it's, it's easier for somebody to like fucking lose their mind. But if you've been trained and trust your training, yeah, then it should be, you know, that I, I have a good friend that's a, a first responder here in Denver. Mm -hmm. And I'm always like, Dude, what is like? What is that like when you pull up on like a bad car accident? He's yeah. like, well, you know, it's like you just do the work. You just do the work, man. Yeah. He's like, you don't think you don't think about. Yeah, you're just trying to make sure you just do what you do, what you're trained to do. 100%. He's like, it's not. It's just a day at the job. Yeah, you know, it's a day. You know, hey, another day at the job. Nope. This is what's going on. We got to get it done. It, it, it felt pretty rare. rare I was hitting curveballs. I mean, yeah, we just we just knew what the process was, and we could hit those too because we practiced so much. And I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, one of my major te teaching points of you know my my kind of personal company is called Ever Onward, and to do a lot of stuff on human performance and leadership and culture. And um, I post and talk a lot about the merits of suffering and of doing hard things. Yeah, if you do them. You're inoculated for when it comes, and not a one of us will escape it. You know, I talk about it. I've got two girls, and I, I'm like, you got to do hard things. Yep. Like, can't is not part of their vocabulary. How old are your daughters? They're 13 and 15 now. But, I nice. mean, I, you know, I remember when my kid was small, and we'd first moved to Colorado. It's snowing, and she's trying to get her, you know, she's at the age where, like, literally zipping a jacket up was hard. Yeah. I remember I'm watching her trying to get her jacket up, and a mom from the playground comes over to help. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. Hmm. she can zip her jacket up. She was ready to call Child Protective Services on me. I was oh, like, yeah. nope. And it took her a bit, and she was crying, and then she got her zipper up. And I was like, yeah, exactly. Yep. So now you get your zipper up. Like, you, Trust me, you got to be able to do these things to build towards. These are all these building blocks of when things get really hard. Because I, I, you know, I agree in the sense that we've created a world that is so comfortable. I mean, you can go for an air-conditioned, uh, you know, air controlled house to the car, to your job, back to the car to the house, never even feel discomfort if you want it. I don't think it's true that everybody doesn't face adversity, not as a counter, but it's just like we all do. I mean, life life is hard, you know, whether that's a change in a job or a relationship or you just not feeling purpose or whatever it might be that you're doing or you made a mistake in, you know, parenting or a relationship. We all face hard stuff. And, you know, again, if you're the type of person that's going to put your head in the sand, you don't stand a chance. You don't stand a But if you do hard things and are willing to suffer, man, you like – you know, we, you and I both love to hunt, and the bulk of hunting is misery. Yeah. And if you don't like <laughs> and, that, and you should pick another it, yeah. sport. It's misery. Yeah. It fucking sucks. Yeah, it's misery. Because especially with the bow, because it's like, you know, if yeah. you're lucky, you've got a 10% yeah. chance. Yeah. And then you succeed, and it gets worse. Yeah. You know, now you got to do now the work. you got to pack that fucker out, out of so there. <laughs> yeah, you got to love suffering, man. Like I said, I mean, we you obviously have the same personality. That That's why I liked SEAL training. I just... I like hard stuff, you yeah. know. So hard stuff's where I feel alive, even though that's your choice. That's terrible. your drug of choice. Yeah, it's that's the drug. Yeah, it's terrible in the moment, but afterwards you're like, ah, now I can go to sleep, and feel good about going to sleep. Yeah, now. yeah. That's the, that was the thing. You know, I did a mountain goat hunt this year in British Columbia, and we were like, what, 150 miles or something from the closest road. Yeah, right. Brutal. So you know, we were bushwhacking for 10 miles and then climbing straight up a mountain, and uh, I was like, you know, it's funny because I was like, well, at least it's not at altitude. <laughs> right you know because right. this would suck at yeah, altitude man, for sure for so sure. it was like and then we shoot this goat i shoot this goat with my bow and i had to pack him out of there and i just remember when we finally got to like where we were going to get picked up uh because they had to fly a bush they had to fly a, a super cub in there and land on the yeah. lake to get us out of there one by one and we didn't know if he was going to be able to get there that night yep and i was like i don't care i just i'm just like so happy to be able to just lay down that's right just lay down and take a nap and it was like, and eat some of that mountain goat. It was like the most 
rewarding thing ever. You know, yeah. it's like the best feeling, uh, you know, and, it, and it's, it's, that's how it is with hunting. It's, it's the suck goes on for so long. And then when it finally, you do all, it's crazy because I, I compare it to pass rushing. Yeah. Because, be, but even in pass rushing, I got to experience a sack, you know, sack and quarterback. That's more. right. Yeah. But I guess it was more opportunity, but you got to think I played 10 years in the NFL, most third downs I was in the game, uh, for, well, I'll just take an eight-year period with two guys, right? Von Miller and I. We had 136 sacks together Savage. in eight years. Yeah, man. But we were in on thousands right. of pass plays. Right, exactly. So for us to be, you know, have like a 10 to 12, 10 to 15% success rate on actually getting the quarterback down with the yeah. ball in his hand. Outstanding. That's like, that's pass, that's hunting. That's sure. bow hunting. It's sure. the same thing. You go, you're close so many times, and then finally it happens. And it's it's crazy because they come in bunches as well. Yeah. So like once you finally like get that success in your but your confidence is lifted. Yeah, of course. And you know, it, and it happens more for you. But it, it's it's the same way. It's the same in hunting as it is in football. As I'm sure that it is as it as it is in uh, combat. It's like once you once you get through that first, I bet that first deployment was like oh shit, it's a lot. You know. But it's then like once you did it and got it under your belt, it's like, oh, it's, it's, I always say this to my daughter, my youngest daughter, she's five years old. Uh, I have a 17 year old and a five year old and the five year old will do the, like, she has no fear, but then sometimes I see her be like, eh, I don't know. I don't want to do it. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. listen, after you do it once, yep, it will be so easy to do it again. Yeah. And I was like, but the same goes for quitting. Yeah. I was like, if you quit, yeah, that's right, man. it's going to be easier that. to quit. Anything you want to do, you're going to quit. I was I like, I'm that, not, yeah. so I just don't let them quit. Yeah. And, uh, and it's funny to see her like, you know, like, like a, a toddler, yeah. you know, be like, Oh, and respond you know, to it and yeah. respond to it. So yeah. it's really cool to, no, be able to pass that, to be able to pay that forward to without to my question, kids, you know? And the, the, there is something unique that I think a lot of people miss about physical, like conflict and suffering. Mm. Right. So it doesn't need to be hunting. It doesn't need to be fighting. It doesn't like, look, if you're not into any of that stuff, you can go, you know, go walk part of the Appalachian Continental Divide Pacific Coast Trail. Go do something. Go hike a 14 er Go hike a 14 er Go do something. And, and in my mind, do something. Just even don't more. do like, it in do September, please. Right. But do something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Stay out of the woods. But but do something hard physically because th there is some transformation. I, I, I don't think I'm not sure how many people recognize like when you see you know, Joe Rogan or, or people like you and, and, and the folks that are on those podcasts talking about the physical things like jujitsu and hard things, why that's so transformational in all other things. Because yeah. if you can, if you can suffer, if you can be in the trenches and if you can take things physically, it just opens up these other things in your brain that lets you handle everything else, you know? And, and I, I, I think, I think there's probably intellectuals out there that are like, oh, the physical side is not important. It's like, it's all linked together. It's trust all me. And together. it's the fastest route. Like, look, you want to go down some horrible, you know, academic intellectual journey. I'm not against that, but you can pretty quickly put yourself in a hurt locker physically and, and just like fast forward to like the lessons you'll gain from that. Yeah. You very, can, very, you quickly. can do that in 30 minutes. Yeah, you could do it. In under. I'll give you a kettlebell no, in 30 oh, no minutes. No problem. No you know problem. What I mean? yeah. get, get a kettlebell in, yeah. in 30 minutes and yep. we can make it suck. You know, when, you when don't cross, even need weights. You can do burpees. And when, fucking, when CrossFit <laughs> was first launching up in NorCal, you know, Glassman and all those guys that were kind of beta testing that they became friends with seals. And there's, you know, some famous seals that have obviously kind of run, you know, the CrossFit games and all that stuff. But I remember when it kind of first got to us at the compound, which you know we're we're working as hard as pro athletes 365 yeah. days a year to go do this job and i remember somebody brings up this crossfit thing and we're like eh. and then they put us through a couple of those workouts some of them are more dynamic workouts like fight gone bad or a couple of those yeah. i remember the one that like tuned me in the most was i remember one was all right this is what we're gonna do no weight nothing you can be naked if you want to just a pair of gym shorts you're gonna do two air squats jumping air squats right so just a low squat jump just so your feet come off the ground you're not trying to michael jordan the thing but two air squats a minute starting again every minute add to a minute and so you do two you're waiting 45 seconds or you know 55 seconds for the next round then you do four then you do eight then you do 16 dude i don't know what number we got to i couldn't walk the next because <laughs> yeah. we're at that mindset we're like well i'm gonna get one more set in and yeah. dude I, like we fell apart and all we did was <laughs> jumping air squats by two every minute you're like dude i I'll put anyone in a gym that's all jacked up, moving way around. I'm like, do this one, man. Yeah. See how you feel tomorrow. Yeah, dude. I yeah, did one. Not uh, hard. The, the day I got drafted, I did this workout. Um, it was a, a CrossFit workout. It was at a CrossFit gym in Ohio. Yeah. I was in Ohio, you know, waiting for the draft. And I was like, oh, I just want to go get a workout in, whatever. And so I went down there with this guy. His name's Nick. And he was like, 
all right, we're going to swing this kettlebell. You're going to do one kettlebell swing and 25 burpees oh. until you get to 25 until you get to 25 swings and one burpee. Oh God. Yeah. And dude, it took, it took like 90 minutes. Right. And by the end of it, yeah. when I was doing the, when I do, I was doing the, uh, the burpees, I was just flopping on the ground. No, I know. It was just like a big sweaty yeah, yeah. F- slop fest. Only and people was, that know, no, I yeah. know exactly. It was the hardest. Where you, oh, dude, it was yes. so hard. I was like, why does this suck so yeah, bad? Yeah. And because, that's one, <laughs> that's the one I'd suggest for people. Like when people talk about working out, I like you and I have probably done all the same things. With you. I did chest and tries back and buys legs. Like we all did that repeat. I'd never want to do that again. I did my whole CrossFit window of time. I train jujitsu. Now I'm a mid grade blue belt. There's a bunch of seals out there that are famous that are black belts of killers. Tim Kennedy, these guys that are like UFC champions, like those are the elite level. I'm in the worst place you can be. All you do is get beat up by people that are better than you. And you're still trying to just figure out the most basic stuff as you're doing it. Yeah. But I love, the, the 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 you know the mental gymnastics of it and the suffering of it and the br- be in bad positions and all those things but like when it comes to those workouts it's just it's just funny how the kind of the the adjacent workouts are the one that I would recommend to people like for the suffering right like oh you can do some dynamic plyometric workout or or gym workout whatever it is dude grab a sledgehammer find a big tire hit that thing 500 times dude go chop Call a tree down morning. go chop Call a tree down morning. with an axe exactly dude that go do sucks. that that people do that all day for a living i know go do that for a day with yourself i like, see what happens to the calluses on your hands yeah. and what your body feels like it's like that's the good stuff yeah, it's man. funny Just we're talking about pick cal- something heavy up and go we're talking about calluses my youngest yeah. is in uh, gymnastics now yeah yeah and she got her first little blister on her oh hand, yeah right and she acted like she acted like it was like the end of the world, right? And I was like, babe, because she's always looking at my calluses. Sure. She's like, Dad, what are like what are these boo boos on yeah. your hand? You know, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, those aren't boo boos; those are just calluses. Yeah, that's that's from work. that's from just using my hands. That's just work. So she got her first little blister, and now every time she get now that it's calloused over, she, every time she gets a new one, she's like proud of it. Yeah. You know, so yeah. like I loved seeing it because she was like, yeah, oh, it hurts so bad. Yeah, you know, I and like I was, that. I like, that. I was like, you're fine. I was like, it's gonna callous over, and you're gonna, it's yeah. gonna be all right. Yeah. You know, and it's like. Um, that's such a good example for life. Right? It is, you it know? is. Like, and th- that's another thing about working out, right? It's like if you want to make some part of your body strong, you hurt it. Yeah. And then it heals and it gets stronger. Then you hurt it again. Like there, therein lies the lesson. That's what I say. Do hard things. When things get hard, you're ready. Yeah. Yeah. You have, to, it, you have to build that foundation, right? So you build a foundation and you keep building on it. And then your threshold is higher and higher and yeah, higher and yeah, higher. Yeah, and for sure. And that's just the way it goes, you yeah, know? And it's, sure. and I, and I think it, you know, on the other side of training, you know, I think it's important to train for what you do. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're, if you're just training, you know, just to like be in shape. Yeah. Um, great. You know? That's cool. But I train so that when I like for here, I'll give you an example on this hunt. I was just on, on the last day, there was a where you know where kite Lake is. Uh, I don't know. Well, it's a, it, you're starting at like almost 11,000 feet. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we're at 11,000 feet and I got to get up to 12, five yep. quick. Yes. Because these elk are going to move and I got to get there quick. So, but there was another hunter putting a stock on these other elk. Like there was two groups of elk, right? There was another hunter putting a stock on. So I couldn't, I didn't want to be a dick and go course, blow his blow yeah. his hunt up, right? Do the right thing. You know, I'm like, all right, I'm not going to... Because I've had a lot of people do that to me, and it yeah. fucking makes me crazy. Oh, of course, of course. And it's like, you can see me up here. I know I stick out like a sore dick. So <laughs> yeah, like, you're not going to miss me yeah, up here. So yeah. I know that yeah. you see me, and you're just trying to fuck this up for me. So I waited for him to do his thing. He blows his elk out, and I immediately just like fucking took off. Yeah, and yep. I ran straight up that motherfucker. And I just was like, I train to be ready for like... My heart rate's at like 170, yeah. and I'm taking shots yep. with my bow. Yep. Uh, you know, tough shots, shots from my knee, shots from like laying down and sitting up sure. and taking a shot, like things that really suck. Yeah. Um, and so I was, I felt confident in the fact that like I can get up there with my heart rate as high, this high, and be able to do it. I'll manage it. And yep. I and I ran my ass all the way up there, and they couldn't believe how fat they're like, dude, how the fuck did you get up yeah. there so quick? Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, because I just didn't stop. Like right. yeah. the only time I stopped twice, I stopped once to turn around and look at them. So they could like, make sure I was like heading, to, but I just picked a scar on the mountain. Of course, yeah. And was like, this is where that bull is hanging out yeah. at, you know, and his cows are just below him. So as long as I can get to that scar, I can drop down on him. Yeah. The wind will be good and everything's great. Yeah, for uh, sure. Well, I get down there and fucking scoot on my butt for like 50 yards, get to 55 yards, and I lean up and there's a cow just staring at me, like right. 10 yards from me, staring right at me. Like, you know how they look. They're like, of course, oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, fuck. I don't know if she saw me, but yeah, yeah. It, it looked, it's not good. And he was, yeah. my buddy that was with me was like, just stay, just fucking chill out, right? And I look up and I was like, no, she's not there. 
So I look up again with my rangefinder to range the bull. And she's like to the left, staring right at me again. So yeah. she had me pinned, you oh, of know. Of course, of course. And I couldn't get up to draw my bow. And the next thing I know, I hear him. And that's the other thing about elk. Like yep. as fast as I got up that mountain, they got oh, down that well, mountain about four or five seconds. At the same time. Yeah. And across the road and up the other side of the mountain, yep. I was like, "Fuck." No, I know. You know? I know. But it was. It's that's how I train for that. Yeah. Like the kind of I'll do. It could be something simple. I'll just do like lunges. I'll do lunges until I'm like. Yeah. Horrific. Like jump lunges, even yeah. like doing jump lunges until I'm like about to fucking fall over and then oh, yeah. grab my bow, pull it back and make a, like a 50 yard shot and try to be, you know, keep a good grouping with three shots. Yep. Yep. Like that's hard to do. Oh, no, no doubt. You know? And yep. it's, but it trains you, it gets you ready for that, for that, for what you're doing. It's yep. the same, probably the same way in the military. You're yep. training for what the fuck you're doing. Right. No, I think there are people that looked at, at seals and how intense the physical side of what we do is. And, and that standard being so high, but it just seemed like the minimum baseline we knew we needed to have so that wouldn't be an issue in the fight. There's all kinds of other things that go wrong. Yeah. Fitness ain't going to be one of the problems. Right, that should no be the way. last one. That was the other thing in football. We always, I should never, a coach should never have to coach effort. Right. Right. Your ass better be in shape. Like, it's not their job to get you in shape. Like, that's a strength coach's job. That means, like, you know, your ass should be in shape. Yeah. And... You know, guys would show up that like for the Ravens, right? Our fucking conditioning test was it sucked. It was five, uh, five three fifties. So it's twenty five down and back six times, Ugh. and um, you have to do that in like fifty five or sixty seconds, and then you get half of that for rest. So you get, or no, it's fifty seconds, and you get twenty five seconds rest, and got to do it again. And if you fail the test, you have to do it again the next day. Sure. And then if you fail it again, you do it. Then I, there was guys that would do it five days in a row oh, and buddy. finally get it. And it's like, yep, dude, that I was, I would show up and I would laugh during that test because I was like, dude, I'm, I'm not going to, this isn't like, this is like the basic little standard of yeah. being in shape for this team yep. of what they expect. So I'm not going to come here and be like fucking struggling in their basic little workout. Yeah, right. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm going to crush this workout. So I would like walk through the finish and yep. just be like, I'm like, dude, this is easy. Like I yeah. got this, you know, it's nothing, you know? And then, uh, but there were, there were guys that would show up and they did. It's like, they'd never even, they knew exactly what they were going to do, but they were yeah. too. And even at the most elite level, guys yeah, are no, still fucking it. off. And not, What's interesting about what you said, cause we have a very similar test in, um, in buds during dive phase. You get in the, what was it? Dive phase? No, no. It was during pool week. Ah, shoot, I'm blanking on when it was now. Uh, we have one that's called the Tread. So you literally put a pair of twin 80s, so two scuba tanks like you'd see on Shark Week. So two of those on your back. Um, I think you got your weight belt, your fins, and you basically just jump in the water. You're facing the pool deck. There's an instructor watching you, and you just have to keep your hands out of the water. Every other part of your body could be underwater, but you're just kicking with your feet, treading to keep it out of the water. You I'm have playing fins water on? Pole. You had fins on, yeah. so you do have fins. I was like, this is going to be a cakewalk. So I volunteered to go first, first five, six of us. Dude, I'm like, it's five minutes. You got to do it. I think at three minutes, I was like, oh, dude, like <laughs> no one's going to pass this. And then I stay. I mean, I go as hard as humanly possible. The instructors are betting on their horses to see who's going to win and make it. And I make it by the skin of my teeth. I make it out of like 40 people in the class at that point, maybe 50, like four of us made it the first day. Yeah. Okay. So just like you said, everybody's doing it again the next day, the next day. If by Friday you don't get it done, you don't carry on with the class. Yeah. And guess what? Almost everybody made it. You're like, dude, so that just lived up here. Yeah. It didn't live it in your all legs. All in your head. I mean, you just did it five you, times. you did it. You did it. You're, you're worse you're on worse. Friday. Yeah. I, worse. I did it rested yeah. or as close as we get. And it's just like you said, it's that mindset of... I'd rather just go all out right now. I'd rather just get it, it done Let's now. Let's just get it done. I don't want to do this shit suffer. again. Yeah, yeah. For it, sure. it, and it's it's funny because it, there was a. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell the story. Then I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to like yeah, your, of course to like your post. I want to talk about some of your like most ex awesome experiences in combat. Sure, like sure. Uh, when I say awesome, you know, not all of them are awesome, but no, I'm no, saying like the ones that are most memorable for you, yeah, good yeah. and bad. Yeah. You know, I want to do. I'd like to do two if we can. But uh, you know, we were somebody said something. We were hiking back to the truck, and it was uh was on this this big hill we had to climb to get back to the truck and he was like are you gonna are you gonna take a break and i was like no was that, yeah. <laughs> i was like no i just want to like i'm trying to get, this sucks so yeah. i'm trying to get there as yeah, fast as we can you know we're yeah. and altitude makes uh coward cowards of us all right it's like a different deal uh you know i say fatigue will make a coward of us all yeah. if you allow it yeah. so i just am like i 
it's like a hike and angry type of deal. Like I'm just, <laughs> fucking, right. yeah, totally. I'm just trying to get, you know, you got that 40 pound pack on you're carrying yeah, around all fucking day yeah. and you know, your shoulders are fucking sore. Your back sore. It's like yeah. the fifth, tith, the sixth, seventh day of this hunt. Yeah, like right, right. you're just, I'm just like, dude, what's the point of just like every time you stop that lactic acid builds yeah, and it gets worse every yeah, time. So I'm just yeah. going right. Yeah. And everybody behind me was like, dude, fucking stop. Like, what, are you in a fucking race to get up there? I was like, yeah. yes. I'm just in a race to be done. I was done. like, I'm gonna, I want to be done. This sucks. Like, I I'm breathing it. hard as shit. You can, I'm breathing so loud you can hunt me in the night. I get it. I get it. You know, it. so yeah. so it was, it's, I do that too. And it's, it's also like, if I hear a bugle, I'm like fucking on a mission. It's yeah. like, boom, I'm just going as fast as I can. Yeah, People have to like pull the reins on me a little yeah. bit. Like, hey, slow down, dude. Like, we don't yeah. have to fucking run over there. I'm like. Well, we kind of do. We might. You know, we might, yeah, you know, we might. We, let's get close at least before yeah. we fucking start slowing down and sneaking on it. Sure. Because sure. elk don't know what noise is. They just hear sounds. Yeah, yeah. And they hear, yeah. they're loud as fuck through the woods. So, yeah. like, we can walk loud. It's not a big deal. Yeah. As long as, like, uh, you're not tinging your bow off of shit and you're not, you know, they it's foreign noise that yeah. they, don't, yeah, exactly. they don't like. Exactly. But, like, the sound of people, of something stomping, that's what they do. Yeah. So, that's yeah. not going to scare them away. Yeah. Um. So, that that's the mentality I have when I hunt. I was the same way in football. I always wanted a coach to tell me to slow down. Mm-hmm. I never wanted him to be like, "Hey, come on, let's fucking go." You yeah, know? of course, of course. I always wanted to be that guy that was you be the guy that's being told to slow the fuck down. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. the coaches are telling you to slow down, and and there was that's like the best feeling ever when a best coach feel. was like, "Hey, yeah. just you know, chill out, easy." I'm like, "All yeah. right, yeah, all I right, just it. making sure." Yeah, for sure. You know, obviously, uh, you know, we have d- days or different days are for different things. You know, walk through days and this and that, but yeah. Uh, that's just like the same intensity, but it's more of a mental day on yeah. a walkthrough, you know? Yeah. So I'm sure you guys had the same things. Oh, for sure. Well, when you're walking through like, Hey, we're going to, this is the building we're going in. Yep. This is what kind of what it looks like. Let's walk through it. And then we build up to full speed, hundred percent, you know? And then now by that time you fucking feel you're ready. You're ready. You you're know? ready. Yeah. All right, guys. I want to talk to you about a product that I've been using for a long time, over a decade. When I was playing football, one of my main staples in my diet was bison. I got my bison from Great Range Premium Bison. They make some of the finest cuts of bison you can get. These guys have ribeyes, ground bison, all the steaks that you want. My favorite part about Great Range is that you don't have to worry about antibiotics or growth hormones in their meats. Great Range Premium Bison is a family owned company providing bison meat from family owned ranches around the country. So please go check out greatrangebison.com. How many deployments did you do total? It's kind of hard to piece and be, I'd say four, you know? Like, yeah. Five, if you totaled like little mini, you know, we do shorter duration hits, but yeah, about four is about the right number. So of those, of those, uh, and how many gunfights do you think you'd say you were in? <laughs> how many firefights? I couldn't count them. Couldn't you? Just a yeah. fuck ton. A lot. Yeah. That's like me trying to say how many snaps of football yeah, yeah. I played. A lot. You know? a like, lot. I don't know. Yeah. No, I got very, like I said, I got very lucky in that regard. I mean, we did one deployment where I think... When we tabulated the missions over seven months, it equaled it was three hundred actual missions that we went on, which there's not that many days and yeah. like multiple things we were doing in a day to get yeah. it was just staggering amount of work. Yeah. Which you probably enjoyed. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. Because what's loved worse it. than just sitting around? Nah, we don't do sitting around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's tough. It's tough for us to be sitting around. So what was um can you can you think of just two or three examples of like times when you were like, Man, this is fucked. Yeah. You know, like this is not good. Yeah. I mean, I, I think um, th- there are a lot that kind of stick out for different reasons, at different points. And there's a bunch of, you know, kind of harrowing stuff that we'll probably be on a hunt sometime in a campfire and we'll tell, we'll tell more of them. I guess for the, the purpose of like highlighting points of things that I thought were interesting. I had one mission in Iraq when we were um, a bunch of Marines were building basically a new outpost. So you got guys on, big cats and D9s and, you know, moving earth and do they're in a combat zone. So you got to keep the bad guys attention away from them so they can actually just do a construction job. And so my team was running basically what would be called presence patrols. We'd go out and basically just walk around outside of where they were and, and, and a good distance to basically draw the enemy to us and create fights so they could go do their job. So you're, you're sort of walking around, say, Hey, shoot at me. Yeah. Like bait, like we're bait, you know, more or less. Our guys are excited about it because they know a fight's going to break out. We're going to win that fight. But I remember we had a bunch of Iraqis, so some of the local guys we were training because we were always connected with them, um, and they were moving with us. And we're and it's you know 116 degrees. It's the middle of the day. It's just absolutely brutal. You got all your kit on, body armor, walking through this horrific desert terrain. I remember there's a like a little village 
that we wanted to get to. We, we'd heard there were some kind of bad guys out there. It might be a good spot to check. And we've got to cross a little canal, so a little irrigation canal, no, no more than about 10 feet across. And I remember we stop right at this intersection on the other side of this crowd. We're safe. We got security set up, but we're like, hey, everybody get a little chow. Like, people are going to crash. We don't get some food. Everybody get some food. Iraqis, us. My guys manage their nutrition really well, but we're like, hey, you guys better start eating or you're going to go go down, even though they live there. So anyway, anyway, everybody eats a bunch of food. We'd often share food with them because they didn't have as good a food as we did or as best funding. And our members were getting to walk out of this place we'd stopped, I see some M&Ms on the ground as, I, as I'm walking out, just some M&Ms that I know for a fact an Iraqi had probably been given and it dropped because one of my guys would not leave stuff behind. And I remember seeing it, something takes my focus, like I see it, somebody gets on by the comms, we've got to deal with that, and we carry on. And I remember we get, you know, a click out of that direction. I was like, man, I shouldn't have left those M&Ms there. Like we're just leaving sign, that's just bad basic infantry combat skills to leave something behind we go down to this little town i think we get in a little bit of a fight down there nothing horrific but just kind of rattle the cages this little of the town we hang out for a while and then we're coming back and i remember we're coming back up to that intersection and i'm i'm the patrol leader so i'm the senior guy of the patrol but i got my point man the heavy weapons gunner up in front of me and i remember my point man who's really really good at his job of course he kind of takes a knee and gets still if he gets still you ever, everybody gets still i kind of scoot up to him and i was like what's going on he's like man i don't I don't like that intersection. Like something's wrong. And I'm looking, I'm like, that's where the M&Ms were, man. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, got it. And I don't even say anything to him. I was like, I like your instincts. Figure out another way across this canal. So not far from there, we backtrack and we go across. There's this big pipe, like an irrigation pipe that goes across the canal. We all go walking across it like two Iraqis fall into the canal. We grab them, you know, we get across it. But I realized when we get on the other side of this c- c- canal, we're, we're hidden behind these willows, like just kind of like their yeah. version of willows. So I know that we could get almost up to that intersection and nobody's going to see us if we get up there the way we can go. So I kind of create in my mind, I'm like, if somebody was doing something bad where the hair on the back of my neck and my point man b- backed up at that, at that intersection, this would be a good way to trick them. So I send my entire team besides myself, one of my best shooters, one of my heaven web 60, you know, gunners that can like lay it down. And one of my explosive guys, I was like, the four of us are staying everybody else patrol out. Cause I bet we had probably 30 some odd guys in that group. There's no way they're going to think 26. They're not going to count and know that people stayed behind. Yeah. So just walk out of here like we're leaving. So I see my team walk away. They get off. I can tell a couple of guys are pissed because they didn't get to stay behind because something good's going to happen. It's going to happen to us. <laughs> sure enough, they get out of distance. I was like, wait about five minutes. We kind of let things get quiet. We start crawling. I mean, just working our way down. I see this corner. And, dude, the second we come around this corner, here's like five bad guys with the you know roadside bomb they had set up to ambush us. I mean, if we'd walked through that intersection, it was like two 80-round mortars. That would have blown up an M1 Abrams tank, let yeah. alone killed half my team. We obviously ruined their afternoon and cut all those guys down, and then it was just like, dude, that was some good stuff. Like It was just one of those like moments where you're like, we made a mistake, identified the mistake, and it didn't cost us. But it was one of those cool like teaching points where you're like, hey, don't leave shit behind. Don't, don't <laughs> like forget the basics ever. Like that was a mistake because cr- they and saw those M and M's. You know, like there's Americans here. for sure, and they might have seen us gone through there, but they damn sure know, knew we walked right through there once we left. The, and and probably I bet there was more stuff left behind than I realized. You know, yeah. so so it was just one of those great reinforcements in a gunfight that you know definitely didn't work out for the bad guys. But but a, but a, a cool moment, kind of reinforcing the training and and then just trusting yourself. That, that that's something my dad really gave my brother and I this idea of just just trust yourself, trust your gut. If something's wrong, it's probably wrong. And the worst thing you do is it's not wrong and you still are aware of the potential of being wrong, move forward. So um, that, that, that was a great one. Um, you know, we had one mission that was really rough to be a part of where a Marine unit that we worked with a lot, one of their young guys, one of their medics was like, you know, 19 year old from name, the center of the country straight, just one of those, everyone you would ever like, be around like he was like your little brother right just that like gun ho good personality great kid um just a gem to be in a any unit would want that kid in there and he got killed by a sniper there's a sniper element that was working in this area we were in charge of hunting that sniper team we'd killed probably six of eight of that sniper cell and we knew the last two were kind of the leaders and of course 
we couldn't we weren't catching them because they're they're being the most careful but they killed this they, they killed this kid we heard that day that he'd been killed and it was just yeah, you know, it was just a gut punch the whole team because we just we're really fond of him his major the the the, the um, marine that was in charge of that unit called us and was like hey if you guys get any intel please let us be part of it i was like no problem we can't always but no problem we did eventually get intel where we thought these two guys were and I talked up to our senior leadership and said, hey, I want to bring these Marines. They're like, you can't. Like, we've already, the battlefield, the way it's been cleared, you can't, they're not cleared to join. And um, I probably shouldn't say this right now. I, I don't think I don't think I can get, the statute of limitations probably won't get me in trouble. I called that major. I was like, hey, I can't bring your whole unit, but if you and your command sergeant major, one of you guys want to come, you come with me and be in my truck. I Like, I'm not asking permission, you come. And he's like, all right, I'm coming. So he comes on that mission. We hit this house, we hit this target. We took fire from a, another building, so it was kind of a hairy mission to where, like, external security was dealing with bad guys out and about. We had a big Spectre gunship over the top of us, which is like having God above the battlefield because they could blow up any building, yeah. hit any target, tell you what's happening. The The reason I mentioned that in there is not so much how much they gave us fire support is they can see everything beautifully well. Yeah. So when we hit targets, if you don't cover it well— if a guy runs, it's called a squirter. Like just a squirter kind of got out of the target. And we get through almost this whole house, get up on the roof. We don't find anybody. And it was pretty good, solid intel that they were there. And I'm talking up to the gunship. I was like, man, did you guys see any squirters? They're like, no, nothing left that target. I mean, if it's if they were there, they're still there. And we're like, all right, research the house, do this. And I'm up on the roof talking to my chief, the major's right next to me, and then the gunship's watch, watching. And all of a sudden, this water tank that's on the roof, like a 100-gallon water tank. We just hear this. Blah, 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 blah. And, you know, it's dead silent. Top, We're all in night vision. I look over, and I was like, did everybody hear that? And they're like, yeah. And, dude, we go over there, and these guys are both hiding in this water tank. I guess the next part of this I probably shouldn't share, but <laughs> I just say we left the major alone on the rooftop. And we're like, we're going to go, you know, check the trucks, and then we'll be back. And... um Pretty cool day to just see the major and him come down to have guys that killed one of your guys to specifically know you got that target was just magic. You know, it was, it was cool to like provide that. You could tell it gave a lot of healing. I mean, it's not going to bring bring their teammate back, but you feel like you you you, you balance the the playing field or the chessboard at that point. So I'll never I'll never forget that one. And then the final one I share, not to overrun, but like. My favorite mission of my entire time in the SEAL teams, I write about it, I think I wrote about it in my first book, was actually not a real-world mission, but it might as well have been because it was, it was pre-9-11, it was right before 9-11 kicked off, and we used to do a lot of, like, kind of um, force security stuff where you'd test facility security on a base, on a submarine, or different things like that. It's what, uh, like, dev group or, like, the top, you know, our top team, Team 6, like, that was their original edict. Besides running combat operations, it was doing all this red cell stuff where they'd sneak around and see if facilities were secure or not secure and things like that. So the Navy was doing a huge exercise down about Roosevelt Roads, Puerto Rico, and they wanted to test their port security. So a ship, you know, big cruiser or something is at, at a pier, hey, are the boats that we have and the security forces protecting this ship? So we get tasked with trying to attack these three ships and put like basically a fake bomb or a charge on the ship or attack it, and let's see, you know, if you can do it. We look at the the mission set and it's it's impossible. I mean, the normal security they'd have on this ship, we would stand a chance, but they actually don't even let us use our rebreathers, which are no bubbles. We could hit a ship. There's no way they'd know. So they're like, that means you need to surface, swim, or do something else to hit these ships. We're like, all right, we looked at it really like detailed, and I was kind of really in charge of this one part of the mission. I was like, I think we need to run three teams, these other two ships, as a deception. Like, your job is to get caught to push it as far as you can, but basically get caught. And then me and my one buddy, we're going to try and go hit this target and actually get it right. And that night we did, we started launching. We're, we, we had to swim across this bay in the ocean, across this bay to where this boat was. The way the lighting was that night, there's a lot of shadows out like kind of in the water. And so it was the most like frogmen I ever felt in my life, right? Because the wars took place in the mountains of Afghanistan and Iraq. Like we didn't spend a lot of time in the water. Like yeah. that, that job kind of went away from us. So my buddy and I are all blacked out, full full wetsuits and stuff, and we swim in. Somehow we get across this bay with boats like swimming, sentries walking with guns up on the pier. We get to underneath this pier. So we're probably, I don't know, 50, 60 yards from this boat. I'm like, dude, we've almost achieved this. Like I, I was like not a pessimist, but I'm like, this is going to be tough. Like this is bullshit security. They, yeah. de they definitely wouldn't be doing this on a normal day. We start doing dive breath holds to go 
underwater to each piling under this pier and come up slow. And then I'd like give a thumbs up my buddy. He'd swim behind me. So underwater, no navigation ability, get up under piling to piling. You're on this breath hold for this whole time. I remember one time he goes down. We're really close to the ship. I'm on a breath hold. I get to the thing. I'm coming up. He grabs my head because he's like, there's a sentry right there. And now I'm like, you're like chicken necking because yeah. I'm like, I need oxygen. Come up. We don't get. Somehow we get to that ship. We swim under that sucker, put this bomb on, get back. We reverse the whole thing to make the story quick. We get all the way out of there. Nothing's nothing seen. And I'm like, dude, we just did the impossible. Like, like, <laughs> like we're legends. We're going to be living legends in this community, even though it wasn't real world. But it was funny. We walked up to the front gate of that ship and kind of told the sentry there, hey, we need to talk to your executive officer, commanding officer. And so they call that back up on the radio, and then they walk us to the ship, and they bring us to the bridge of the ship. Well, based on like that old game telephone, when the word gets passed, the commanding officer thought he'd caught us, and we were the last pair to be caught. So he thought he'd won the night. And so I get all the way up into his combat center and we're in there as XO. And he's got this kind of grin on his face. He's like, hey, you know, you boys did a good job. I mean, I know you're the Navy SEALs, but we got you. And I was like, you bet you might want to start running your command, you know, emergency drills because you've got a bomb on your ship. And dude, I wish I had video of this guy's face. <laughs> I, I wish. And God bless him. He's like, is there really one of the shots? I was like, there is. He's like, Man, well done. Appreciate it. And then we left, and sure enough, they do their whole drill. They find it. But, like, we got back to the team, and they're like, dude, this is, like, they're going to be talking about this forever. <laughs> Even though it's, like, literally no pre-9-11 was coming. Yeah. If 9-11 had never happened, that would have been the greatest stop in the history of the SEAL teams, like, post-combat Vietnam. But, uh, <laughs> no, it was just, you know, the thing, the thing that I loved about that job as much as any, and this will ring, I'm sure, near and dear to your heart, is I think all of us as humans are best in our lives when we're at play. And whatever that play looks like. And I think, sadly, a lot of people think play ends when you're a kid. And look, you got to play through a professional career and get paid to do it. I got to play. I mean, I didn't get paid a lot. But that's not why I did it. But I got paid to play with the best gear, the best technology, the best dudes on the international stage in the highest level threat scenario you could do. My entire job was play. I mean, every time anybody talks about it, like, it must have been brutal. I'm like, I, I was playing Cowboys and Indians. You're for having real. fun. Yeah. And, and hunting is now that same thing. So I, I try and keep myself at play as much as I can. And, well, and, well, you got to do yeah. If you don't do something that you love, yeah, then you are working, yeah. Yeah. Tr truly working. And right? look, I'm sure there's people that for finance, it's play. Probably the guys that yeah. are the high, gals in, at oh, the highest level it. of that game, they they're playing it. those games and, and playing Monopoly, and they're like, oh, boy, we just won the day, you know? So, yeah, it was it was fun. They love it. it. Fun. They love those guys. Those finance guys love that shit. They love it. They love it. Like, I, I hate it. But they love it. It doesn't do yeah. anything for me. But they yeah. would hate doing the shit that I like to do. Of course. Probably, you know? Of course, yeah. Hey, everybody. This episode is brought to you by Black Buffalo. Black Buffalo's nicotine pouches do not contain tobacco, leaf, or stem. What they do contain is a ton of flavor, and they're packed with pharmaceutical-grade nicotine. The magic of Black Buffalo is they discovered a way to make cured edible green leaves behave like the texture of tobacco. And they add food-grade ingredients for industry classic flavors. You're in good company if you roam with the Black Buffalo herd. The business was built by dippers with decades of smokeless tobacco use. They manufacture their tobacco alternatives with respect for those products that came before them. Bold flavors, full pouches, metal lids, and a brand that stands for something, America. Their products are also proudly endorsed by brand ambassadors such as MMA Hall of Famer, Cowboy Cerrone, NASCAR champion, Brian Blaney, rising country star, Larry Fleet, and Rob O'Neill, former U.S. Navy SEAL Team 6. So if you're 21 and older and you consume nicotine or tobacco and you want to join the Black Buffalo herd, head over to blackbuffalo.com to learn more. You can order nicotine pouches online and they ship directly to most states. Or you can check out their store locator to purchase pouches at thousands of retail locations around the country. Black Buffalo, an American brand, pouches worth respect. All right, well, let's talk about post- yeah, military. So what was what was like the hardest part of transitioning out of that? What what led to you wanting to yeah. exit? Yeah, you know, um I was at about the 12, 13 year mark, a full military career to get to retirement is 20 years. And it's pitiless. You could go 19 years and 9 months and if you don't make it to that 12 month, you get no retirement, nothing. They don't prorate it. So you got to see the finish line. 
And if you get to about 13, 14, it's pretty rare somebody will leave. He's like, dude, you got six years left to get to full retirement, medical, dental, everything for the rest of your life. So it's hard to leave. I just could tell I'd done everything I wanted to do in the teams. I'd led combat assault teams the whole time. I'd run training. I'd come back to run the basic course of training, some of our advanced stuff. Um, I just sort of turned over every stone I wanted to turn over. And I, I, one of my jobs after my combat rounds was being what's called a flag lieutenant or the admiral's aide. So it's a junior officer that travels around with a two and three star admiral or general and the different service you're in to kind of see the big meetings up at DC and at the Pentagon. And I kind of saw that meeting and, and they, they pick good people for that. You can't apply for that job. They pick the guys that they think, Hey, this guy's probably going to be an admiral someday. Let's give them kind of exposure to that side of things. I just looked at it and was like, Oh, I think I'm going to be staring at a computer for the rest of my life. And I mean, it's, it's important. You need good people doing it. I just, I could tell it wouldn't be for me. It'd, it'd get into that admin side of stuff, which I just didn't enjoy, you know, and I, I, I knew it was time. So I, I, I also wanted to be around my bride. I wanted to be around my kiddos. I'd made my family watch me disappear into the, you know, into the ether for so many times, not knowing if I was going to come back. It felt like it was time to pay them back. So I went back to grad school to kind of get like a diet business degree there in San Diego. And and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew it was time. So I was kind of prepping the battle space for that to happen. And then I'm, I'm one of the instructors at our basic training command. This film company shows up at the command to basically help do some new commercials and some new footage to help with recruiting. Cause our, 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 all of special operations were down on numbers. A lot of the guys that aged out were moving on, weren't getting as many young guys kind of up, up into the force. So we kind of felt like we got to do something to get some kind of marketing out there. It's not what we do. Um, and all the videos were like back in the day, like what, when we were probably in college, you know, they like when I was in college, just older videos, of the SEAL team was just ancient stuff. Um, and so they came in, they did these commercials. Then all of a sudden, they basically asked all of us to participate in this movie to help kind of promote the films. We thought this thing was going to become like a Walmart bottom DVD bin recruiting film. All of us actually said no when they first asked us. Everybody that was in this movie was like, nah, not what we do. And then we eventually got put on orders. And fortunately, the guys that were in the movie are really high reputation good dudes. They knew it'd be like, well, if somebody had to do it, at least we didn't put a jackass in front of us, like kind of representing our, our community. And so this movie, Act of Valor, got made. And it was very strange. Like I said, we thought this thing was going to be like a documentary, you know, Walmart deal. Next thing you know, it was the number one movie in America. We didn't get paid. We were on regular Navy pay, chow, to go do this film. But it did, you know, kicked open a couple doors. I loved, like I told you, that Churchill book is why I joined the military. I, I love to write. And so I, I wrote a book kind of about the things I learned and the lessons of my time in the military. What, what's that? That was the, that that first was the one's bestseller, called, right? Yeah, damn few. It uh, it made the list. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I'll never talk, ever talk trash about another teammate. It, she's um, going to yeah, pull that yeah, up real yeah, quick. Yes, the first go. one on the right is damn few. And it's it's that one's more autobiographical, kind of like what we've talked about today. My story, why I joined, the high point lessons I learned um, from my time there. And I, you know, like I said, I won't knock other teammates. It, it's Some people really wrote about, obviously, very specific missions, you know, how many people they kill, what they did. I, I tried to steer clear of that. It's like, look, this is what I learned. This is my just tremendous like honor and like blessing that I got to go do this job and, and hopefully that can help you. But that, that book, you know, you go out and promote a book. It was pretty early in the seal books, you know, now you can't swing a dead cat without 50 <laughs> seal books, you know, which is fine. But I was early in and it was funny when I was out promoting the book, you know, and I got back from that at Barnes Nobles, different spots, like a, a guy that worked up in LA, he's like, you know, you know, people make a living like speaking, given corporate events or things like that. Yeah. And I was like, that's not a thing. He's like, it's a thing, man. And every time you're coming back, they're like, you're a great storyteller. They love it. I was like, all right. And so they booked me for a couple of speaking events. It just kept going. And now it's like 10 years in and, you know, it's made a living for me. So and you're still uh, doing that. Yeah, it's been great. I mean, that's, that's when did the, you write your second book? Probably four years later. Actually, um, I was in New York City. Uh, promoting something. I can't remember. I was actually think I may have still been sort of promoting the first book, but the weirdest, one of the weirdest phone calls I ever received is a teammate called to tell us that Chris Kyle, one of our teammates in Iraq had been killed in Texas and been shot in the back by a teammate that obviously had mental health issues. And I was like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Like all the stuff we all survived together as teammates. And this guy gets yeah. shot in the back by a fellow teammate. But what was kind of gross about it is over the next couple of days, like a bunch of the Hollywood, some of the Hollywood kind of elite, 
started like Michael Moore, who's just seems whatever, seems like a loathsome person that makes these terrible movies anyway. But like you were saying, like, well, you know, snipers are kind of cowards and they shoot people from a just these weird conversations about Chris. And so my daily rag is the Wall Street Journal. I love reading the Wall Street Journal. I'm not a finance guy. I read it for the opinion page because I think it's some of the best political reporting and best writing in the country. I'd always wanted to write something that would get into the Wall Street Journal. So I actually wrote an article called The United States of American Sniper. And it wasn't so much just about Chris, but it was about how, look, it's kind of funny that you guys are making fun of Chris in this country because he's the person that went overseas and would do the job to maintain your ability to say whatever you want, to not be held accountable for it, and to enjoy what we enjoy here. So in some ways, you actually talking trash about him is honoring his service and his, and his death. And so I kind of wrote that as a counterpoint. My liter agent from the first book was like, dude, I'm in a coffee shop in New York City. I'm hearing people talk about your journal article. It's like, it might be time to write another book. And I was like, all right. So we we kind of kicked around the ideas. And the second one's a lot more, um, the first one's kind of got a story arc of my life. The second one, you could read chapter one, chapter five, three, nine. They're more essays about, you know, service, politics, the future of the country. There's a whole chapter on killing. I mean, I, you know, I just kind of picked off these subjects that I wanted to talk about. And it, it did well as well. You know, the books are hard. I'll definitely probably do more, but it's, you know, they don't write themselves, so it's a big right. effort. And I always want to have purpose in what I'm doing. And that's that's kind of figuring out where that intersection is now. I mean, the corporate speaking thing, I really enjoy. I mean, I like talking to people and doing it. Conversations like this, I love. The whole podcast co cast space and the the reach you can get with it is um is pretty special. So trying to kind of figure out that next avenue to kind of get teaching and mentorship out in the world. Cause I, I do think we're at a time when boy, I look at young people, I'm like, I hope there's somebody good for you to emulate, follow, and learn from. Cause I I had them, you need them, and they're there. You know, you just gotta be out there. Well, the, they're there, it. but our our the media won't pump those people. It's hard. Like, yeah, it's hard. There's you're, like an attack on toxic masculinity. You yeah, know? man. You're sort of pushing a rock uphill. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. it's a tough uh it's, you know, especially social media will, that like, they'll shadow ban you. They'll yeah. make it so that, yep. you know, if you're not pushing what they want, yep. then they will make it so nobody but sees the it. The algorithms are tough to crack. Even people man, that sure. follow you yeah, I know. won't see it. I know. Yeah, it's And wild. it makes me crazy. Yeah, but, it's um, yeah. But I guess to, to wrap that whole thing up, I was super blessed in my transition. A lot of guys transition have a really hard time. They don't find purpose. They don't find a direction. They don't find a way to keep the lights on. Um... I sort of left and because of that speaking, it was like, dude, I just made more in two months than I made in a year and a half in the Navy. I mean, it wasn't like game changing. I'm going to go buy a house in La Jolla money, but it was, I can damn sure get out of the Navy and like keep things going money. Yeah. So, you know, it's been great and it's grown since then and been, been, and, a, and, and what's the, experience. and th you have a name for that business? Yeah. My, my company's called ever onward. So ever onward. people go to my website, which is Rourke .com. You know, I got a bunch of content on there. You can book me for speaking there and I run, you know, a bunch of different type, you know, campfire sessions, these, you know, these conversations I did around campfires. I did this TV show with John Cena that just popped up right there, which was fun. <laughs> but, um, but you know, I haven't really embraced the, the, the power of social media and some of the things that, that we're talking about. So I've, I've put the gas pedal down pretty hard um, tomorrow. Actually, when I, when I leave you, I'm going to meet with my buddies tomorrow to, you know, film some more content, just get more good, like life lesson, leadership, culture, human performance lessons out there in the world that people can digest from somebody that, you know, I hope knows what he's talking about. Yeah. Well, so, I think, yeah. I think what you do is you film, film your speaches. Yeah. And yeah. then take those little clips and yeah. put those little clips on social media. We're, we're doing more of that. That's yeah, where that way people, sure. cause that's what, that's how th this, uh, the consumption of it's like nonstop consumption. Yeah. Right? No, fucking is, information for yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, if you can give them little snippets, yeah, they can be like, Oh, and then all it takes is for one CEO that's somewhere right. to see that. And then they're like, Oh, we want to get that. Let's have this guy come talk. To that's us, right. You know? So yeah, we're doing a lot more of that. The, the other one that I really want to try and sink my teeth into, I, I think the podcast, space is awesome and then the other one is sort of some live events i mean the one thing right as i was driving to come see you one of my teammates that i was with since day one um just an absolute beast of a man and one of the best operators i ever met he called just to catch up and i'm like i just want to do in-person events to bring some of my instructors buddies there so i can get the band back together you know yeah. just take some people out do some hard things learn some lessons talk chat eat, you know spend some time together and if i can do that and it just funds me and my buddies getting back together it'd be it'd be worth it just to do that so, yeah yeah that'd be yeah. fun yeah that yeah. sounds like a really good yeah time. man so what do you what is like the the latest 
um, project that you're working on. You're working yeah, on, I'd, I'd, is, I'd is say, that what you'd say is I, like the I'd, social media I'd say side it's of things? It's a lot and... more of kind of just getting the content. Uh, what, what I found was I'd get a bunch of people reaching out to me like, look, if my company doesn't book you, I, I don't get to see you do these speeches. Yeah. And just as you said, we've started ripping a bunch of individual stories and cuts and clips from those and then producing this is some of the new stuff you know this is me over in africa on the left and then you know just like you're saying these are quicker hit um i'm doing a question of the week and people de you know define who they are and you know just trying to get some conversation going then a bunch of others are just you know stories from my time you know in training on the battlefield and lessons i learned that are quicker hits people can digest them fast and and kind of move the needle. So I'd say I'd say this stuff is like the most current. You know, it's that's a good. I want to talk about that real quick. Yeah. Because yeah, you know, I think about this a lot. Um, who are you, right? Yeah. Like who? How do you describe yourself, right? Because other people, especially if you're like like as an athlete, right? Yeah. Everybody thinks they know who I am. Yeah. They yeah. think they can describe who I am. Yeah, for sure. But yeah. how do I describe myself? Yeah, it's important, right? And um, I think it's important. I always I had coaches, really good coaches, one time tell me don't ever read your news clippings mm. because that's not who you are. Yeah, be sure. who you are. Yeah. You know what I mean? Don't ever be, uh, you know, you're more than a football player. I'm more yeah. than a, a, you know, I'm a father. I'm a husband. You know, I'm a hunter. Yeah. I'm a, uh, I'm an athlete yeah. and I am a man, yeah. you know, and those, yeah. what the, and then it, within those five things, you know, what are your principles? What are your, yeah, exactly. You know, so sticking by your principles, which I'm never, I'm never perfect, but I, you know, I try to be, yeah, no, you know, it's hard. It's yeah, good, and it's like I'm growing every year. You know, retiring at 34 years old was like, yeah, it's a, it's a strange. Like, you know, time. I, well, really, I was 32. I retired yeah. at 32 years yeah. old, so it's like you have so much life. You know, hopefully another 60 years, of course, of life yeah. to like do things. Yeah. So it's like that's why I was like, you know, I'll start a podcast because yeah, I like it. I like talking to people. I like having conversations. Yeah. So you might want to think about maybe doing a podcast. Either. Yeah, no. And some of the, that new stuff that's up there is a real podcast feel. And it was kind of born out of that. The guys I'll be filming with tomorrow, I did a podcast with him and it was funny. The feedback was like, Hey, the stories are great as always love seeing you. It was gorgeous, man. Who filmed that thing? And it was just a buddy that's got a good, it, it looks a lot like your room and it's yeah. got an aesthetic that all of us would like, right? It's got some, you know, turkeys and, and barn wood and all the stuff that we kind of gravitate towards. So yeah, I think it's coming. It, it's, um, it's trying to figure out how you want to do it. Do you want to do this? Do you want to have the one-on-ones? Do you want it to um, just be a little bit more of us? You know, of us talking, I heard my own voice come booming <laughs> through the headphones. Yeah, so it's it's got a podcasty feel, not as much of a conversation. So we'll see where it grows. I'm I, I feel like I'm kind of um prospecting right now because you do get a yeah. sense of putting a few different styles out there and then say, you know, what are people responding to? If they're like, look, the thing they're responding to is your 30 second you know, thoughts every Friday on this. All right, let's do that. Or if they're yeah. like, we want a longer conversation, do that. So yeah, uh, definitely more to come on that for sure. That's pretty awesome. Dude. Yeah, good man. for you, man. Yeah, appreciate it. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Well, we'll, we'll subscribe. Get you later. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I want to I want to wrap this up real quick, but I want to yeah. um, the last question I want to ask you. I, I, you see me looking at my phone. I have to have notes. Or oh, I can't I'd be stay. the same. No, you're not. She'll tell you, I'm doing good. I'm staying on track this time, huh? Yeah. Normally, I'm it. like. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, uh, my ADHD kicks in. No, I, I got excited, notes everywhere. So man. I have to yeah. keep notes. I'm with you. Um, I'm with you. So what would you say, um, like, if, like the average guy, right? The average guy is like, you know what, man? Like, I don't, it, no matter what their age is, I want to, like, cultivate a different mindset. Yeah. What would be your number one piece of advice? Like, even make it like three or four things sure, that they sure. could do today yeah to start switching their mindset from like you know what man i'm tired of like i want to take control of my own life and yep. i want to be my own man and yeah and uh, what, how would you how would you uh coach somebody in that? yeah yeah i mean the thing i'd say is do, do the thing you can utterly control which is I, I love early mornings because that that's unimpeded time so whatever time you get up, like, 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 let's say you're the guy that's asked me questions. Let's say you get up at six in the morning. I say, oh, let's back that up to five. It's not a big ask. I mean, maybe you get to bed a little bit early, but you back it up or back it up to 530, right? Give yourself a half hour. I've got a mentor that, that has a very disciplined morning schedule and I've, I've amended it to the way I like doing things, but I try and start my day the same every day. And I try and start it with discipline. So I, I, I get up early and look, 
Jocko Willink, who was a teammate of mine in Iraq, he's famous for this. You, you see his Instagram page is a picture of his watch that says 430. That's when he gets up every day. It's the only thing on his Instagram. Like, all right, Jocko's up. He's doing it. You know, so there's there's something to starting your day with a little bit of hardship and discipline. It doesn't just need to be hard. Like my, my routine is I get up. I've got I've got a book and I've got a notepad so that's something I'm reading and then a, a, a notepad that I can write something in. I'm going to do some breathing exercise just to kind of charge myself up and get it going and have a little peace. You're probably wired like I am. I have intensity in everything I think and feel and do. So that allows me to just kind of take some deep breaths, like run my system and get started. I'll take about 10 minutes to do that. I'll take about 10 minutes to read something that I want to like dig into or look at and not just reading the paper. Like I read something about stoic philosophy or some history or something that I want I take about 10 minutes to write a little something, some purpose, something that I, it might be a note to my daughters that day. It's what hits me. I don't have something that I hold myself to, but I do those three things and I start my day. You know, it's kind of like McRaven, who's a famous seal at UT that gave the, gave the story about make your bed in the morning. It's just starting your day with a process of something that you control and leads towards, like you're saying, you can either, you can either not do it or quit, or you can do it. Either one's going to become a habit. And so if you make that habit in the morning, something that you is as purposeful for you and sets you on a course to kind of like navigate that day, that would be, be my advice. I mean, I think the whole rest of your day could damn near fall apart. You know, you at least did that. Yeah. I mean, look, <laughs> add a max set of pushups to that. You're doing better than you were yesterday. I guarantee you. Yeah. But I, I, I would put in a rhythm or a discipline every day to kind of start your day with purpose, focus, start a routine, gratitude. You know, a routine that kind of just gets you off, and that will bear fruit in other things. You'll do that and be like, eh, you know what? I'm going to skip the Frappuccino today because I actually just did 100 push-ups, read a little something. I want to lose eight pounds. It's not going to help if I drink that. So you'll just yeah, get maybe that, I'll have a little protein shake. Get that instead, get yeah. that system of doing something with some discipline in the morning. Try and finish your night with a little quiet. I think people are so. I think one thing, well, I don't think, I know one thing we love about hunting is like the lack of noise. Yeah, the lack of noise just, and the lack of light. It's just like the light, the lack of light, the lack of input, the lack of intensity. You're just kind of like, look, man, I'm actually looking at constellations right now. I'm smelling nature. I'm like, all right, that tree's rotting. That tree's blooming. The grass is great. We're just out in this beautiful spot. I don't think it's a mistake that, you know, getting in the woods, getting in the outdoors, you know, being in spots where you have peace. I'm pretty, uh, even though I have a you know, kind of public facing job, you might be the same. I peg the needle introvert. Like I'm not an extroverted person. I, I, I like my own time. I like the very small group of people I really like. I love my family and being around them first and foremost. And then I need solace. I need time to kind of center myself. And I think, I think that, 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 that morning program that we're talking about gives you that at the beginning of the day too. Yeah. Cause probably nobody else is up in the house. You well, get a chance to just start. Yeah, be by yourself for yeah, a little bit. Yeah, be with your own thoughts. Yeah, that'd be my recommendation. I think I, I, uh, I that's the same that I tell people. I'm like, dude, just wake up in the morning and start a routine. Get it. Give yourself, a, like I always like to give myself an hour. Yeah. You know, before I, I like it. I usually, I use that's how I usually do it. I'm trying just come back from this hunt, so I'm like trying to get as much extra sleep as I <laughs> can course, before I course. get my daughter up for school. Yeah, but, exactly, exactly. Because uh, she's got to be up, you know, at seven a.m. So yeah. I'm like, normally I am up at five thirty. Five thirty yeah. is like my wake up yeah. time. Uh, that's when I wake, I wake up at four 30 when I hunt, yep. I wake up at four, five 30. I don't have a nine to five. So yeah, right. I wake up, get my daughter fed, I eat, get her to school. Yep. I come and I train yep. and then the rest of my day is it's yours. I'm, I'm either podcasting or I'm yep. doing different meetings or whatever, but like, that's the, that's the, I, the purpose of having like a routine. Mm -hmm. Right. So I like look forward to my routine. Yeah. I like when I get out of my routine, I'm like, I can't wait to get, get back to my routine. Yeah, you know? For sure. So that's, yeah, you feel destabilized when you're not kind of in that rhythm. Yeah. And there's trips that'll take you from it. And I, I still try and do little touches of that. I've never been to a place where I couldn't get up 10 minutes early, just to do a little something. Yeah. You know, you can always add that little bit. Yeah. And for me, I do, I do it with standard. coffee. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. me. Like if I can have, oh, no, it's great. If I can have my morning coffee, yeah. you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, there's other, there's certain things. That, here's a book that I think you'll like. Um, it's called uh, The Crow Killer. Mm. And it's about, um, it's the real story of Jeremiah Johnson. Oh, wow. Cool. Um, but his name is John Johnson or something okay. like that. Or I forget if it was real name, but it's called it The Crow yeah. Killer. Yeah, um, I'd love to read. I'll grab and it. And I listen to a lot of audio books. Yep. And it's a really good audio listen. And it's about this. Uh, he was like a six foot three, six foot four dude. Yeah. Back in old trapper right. days. And, and he's like 1800s. Yeah. 
And he was like six, yeah. So he's like six three, two hundred sixty yeah. pounds. Scariest person alive. And he, uh, uh, he killed a bunch of Crow Indians because they killed his wife Boy. and his unborn child. Yeah, yeah. So he like went on like a fucking tirade, tirade, you yeah, know. Right, and right. Uh, the stories of him are like, you know, he just would kick them, and they would die because he was so big, yeah. you know, so much bigger than them. Uh, then you know he would collect all the scalps, and it's just like it's pretty. I mean, it's violent, but it's also like he ends up coming around to like to love the crows. Yeah. By the end of it, it was oh like once man, he, neat. You know, so it's really cool how he yep. comes around to like be. You know, he was named a chief at one point. Like yeah, it was pretty. Wow. Yeah. It oh, was, I'm definitely gonna look for it. Yeah. It was, yeah, I think people don't. You, you realize this playing an elite level of sport. I th- I, I think when when people think of sport or combat they always think somehow hate is involved and that that never no. like entered my heart. Like I, when I played lacrosse in college, I was like, look, I, I didn't, I didn't like Johns Hopkins or Virginia cause they were our like top tier enemy, but I was super excited when they showed up to play that day. Yeah. If they didn't, we got, there's no game. Yeah. And my respect for the Taliban and, and, and for, um, you know, our enemies was not so much in obviously their, you know, behavior, their doctrine and what they're doing in the world. But I damn sure respect that they're on the battlefield, and and you know some of them ran, some of them didn't. And, and you have look, to respect them. I respected it, and and I don't get to do my job if they're not. If they're always not respect to do theirs, your enemy, yeah, man. So um, that's cool. I'll look for it. Yeah. All right, awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rourke. I, no, appreciate, I appreciate the it, time. Brother. I enjoyed it. Yeah, this was a great conversation. I was really looking forward to it. So. Nah, we'll do it again, and let's get out in the woods together. Let's do it, man. All right, thanks for listening to the Wolf Untamed podcast. Be sure to check me out on Instagram, DerekWolf underscore 95. Check out the Wolf Untamed podcast on YouTube. You can listen on all the other platforms, as well as DerekWolf.com. 